Tonight's guest on Set the Trend Live, legendary DJ Norman J, Raheem Devon. And now, here come your hosts. Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome as they pile into the room. Today, welcome to Set the Trend podcast, all the early ones that are getting in there. Good evening. Prue, usually one of the first ones in there. She is this week, so good evening yeah. to Prue. Go on, Prue. We should give her a, a prize. We should, shouldn't we? Hey, go, Prue. Big kiss for me. Yeah. Good evening, hey, Prue. Hey, mine. Uh, have you seen her husband? <laughs> oh, yeah. <sorry. laughs> you wouldn't play, mate. You wouldn't, you wouldn't play at all. But good, but good evening, Reggie, and good evening, East End. This is a big show today. Very what? big show today very big show today um i don't know there's nothing i could say that really describes how important this gentleman is to the scene and how important he is to our scene especially um as he's the gentleman that gave our scene that the name literally the rear groove scene came from this gentleman today and we're very excited to be talking with him he doesn't do much interviews at all (laughs) yeah It's funny. He just. It's funny. He just said um, while we was having a, a little conversation in the green room that he's only done five of these types of interview all year, and you know it's a pleasure to have him on a on set the trend. It's a pleasure. Will be sure is. And I see you're paying homage to him on your background there. Yeah, and also got me got me at. <laughs> As well, funny, and I've got my Gabichi top on, old school Gabichi top here. Don't play, do not play old school all the way today. So, big up, um, big up. So, we'll be talking to the legend that is Norman J. If you just joined us on Facebook, can you just share the link? If you've joined us on YouTube, can you just like and subscribe the page, please? Right, we've got a lot to get through today, and um, let's start. So, Jay Z, Jill Scott. Reggie, sorry. Jill Scott. <laughs> Jill Scott Heron. I've got in my notes, Jill Scott Tinder. Oh, they're the ones that are inducted into the Hall of Fame. Jill, alongside... Jill Scott Heron. <laughs> Jill Scott Heron. Tina yes. Turner. Yes. Hello, Cool J. Clarence yeah. Levant. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, Jay-Z has been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, he's famous for his 99 problems, but definitely getting into the Rock and Hall of Fame is, isn't one of the... Wow, what can you say about Jay Z? You know, he just keeps on breaking records, making history. The first making money, uh, the first living solo hip hop artist to be inducted into the exclusive club. Exactly. Oh, oh there it is. Oh, and those are some he, look. Look at the, some of those names that are on there. Brooklyn, I got big up Clarence Avant, who is like an absolute legend in the game. He's the person, the glue that has put together so many deals from Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis to uh, uh, P. Diddy and loads of other people. So, uh, yeah, he's like the backroom fixer. Yes. And as Ray said, Gil Scott Heron, Carol King, LL Cool J, all been inducted into the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the uh, Jay Z will be performing at the ceremony in October in Cleveland, uh, so that's one to look forward to. And of course, the other two rappers, solo rappers, who are no longer with us, who's been inducted into the Hip Hop Hall of Fame, is none other than Tupac Shakur in 2017 and the Notorious B.I.G. in 2020. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Right, um, another legend from one legend to another le- legend, Bob Marley. The most celebrated and recognized artist in the music history died 11th of May, you know, 40 years ago today. And his album, Legend, Billboard Charts, has been on the Billboard Charts for 676 weeks. Wow. Which which equals 13 years. Chart topping album contains all of the mega hits of Bob Marley. And it's a big achievement. And, you know, one of the things I I always say about, you know, never got an opportunity to see him in in concert. 
missed the Rainbow Theatre, I missed the Lyceum, and I missed the one, well, not even missed the one, I wasn't old enough to go. But he wasn't, old, sure enough. About that? He wasn't old enough, mate. He wasn't no, I, wasn't, old enough. I wasn't old enough. Okay. I really wish I could see that, see that man in concert, but never did. I thought you were first to get the vaccine because you were in the over 60s group. <laughs> <laughs> He just looks neat. Anyway, um, Joe Budden podcast. Reggie, what the hell is going on with Joe Budden? Well, you know, this podcast, it's gone from strength to strength to even stronger. And it seems like the wheels are finally starting to come off. I think success has now finally uh, become the nail in the coffin. Marl and Rory, um, they had a bit of a dis dispute regarding ownership of the podcast and how much percentage and stuff like that uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, um, recently, the latest is that Joe Budden on his podcast live fired Marl and also Rory live on the podcast. And um, it seems like it might be coming to an end. So it might be no more. Joe Bodden podcast, which is not a bad thing for us, because guess what? You've got set the trend. But Reggie, <laughs> Reggie, you know, you know, you're in charge. You know, you're the man. You're the corporate man. Are our contracts watertight? Um, no, they're not actually. You just remind me, actually. Yeah, well, I've got, got. We got. We got to sort sort it out we, for. The, yeah, we got to be careful because we, we we don't want to be getting the the Joe Budden treatment. We don't want to be getting served like. <laughs> yeah, I know. For the next season, don't worry. Don't worry. We'll let's, do, have a, <laughs> let's have a let's have a chat between ourselves. The uh, difference is the difference say, is. I'm not to digress, <laughs> but the difference is, is that Joe Budden saying that he started the podcast on his own. It was a Joe Budden podcast on his own for about 10, 11 episodes, and then Rory and Mal. Rory came in and then Mal came in a bit later on. So he's saying it was always his. It was always his product. This product is our product. So there's a difference to it. You know what I'm saying? To <laughs> so we're all right then. We don't have to, we don't have to panic, you know? <laughs> well, the good thing about it is that we've got the evidence online. We were first here. <laughs> Go back to the anyway, original Stop it. You lot. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Behave. So what do you reckon happened? Do you reckon because he's done it before and then he's got them back? Do you do you do you reckon it'll be that love, you, you know, that love hate relationship when where they break up to make up? Money talks, man. Yeah. Money talks. They got to <laughs> split 33, 33, 33, and then it would be all good. <laughs> well, I, the interesting thing about that is that um, people are saying that Joe's been preaching for the whole year or two years about people should know what they, what's in their contract and they mm -hmm. should get what they're worth. You know what I mean? And <laughs> then he goes and fires them. But then some people are saying, but if you go and work for somebody, which is, if that's what they were doing, working for somebody, you, 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 like, you know, you can't go and start working for a big corporate company or even or even like your local Tesco's and then say to Tesco's, well, hey, well <laughs> you can't find me. I want, I, want, I, want, I want a piece of the company. It doesn't work. You know what I yeah, mean? Exactly. Boss, employee. You know what I mean? So this will be interesting to see what goes on. He did say if they want, they can take him to court as well, didn't he? So yeah, yeah, yeah. what happens with that. Right. Oh, very serious topic. It is Mental Health Week. Mental Health Awareness Week this week. So... You guys know we've been preaching throughout the pandemic. Um, and this is a topic that people have been coming more aware of. I know Prince Harry was on yet another podcast this week and he was talking about certain 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 situations to do with it. His one was the trauma that can be brought on from your parents. You know, you you, you know, your parents pass on to you what did the trauma that was going on in their life and then you then you know unwittingly pass it on throughout your throughout your throughout the generations to your child and everything else mm -hmm. and also people who are suffering because they're alone mm -hmm. people are not being checked up on sometimes you look okay but inside you're not okay so mental awareness week is week is a serious serious topic so we do kind of implore some of you to check on one another reggie you have you got anything to add to that yeah, just make that call. I've got a few friends who openly uh, suffer from mental issues. A lot of people in the music industry as well um, suffer from it. Um, and, you know, just make sure that if you need help, please go and get them and go and get it. It's not the end of the world. And the stigma behind mental health is becoming less and less um, a taboo subject. So, um, you know, please, please do um, call uh, people. I think there are some great kind of like helplines like the Samaritans and various sablers around who you can actually call if you need to speak to somebody. 
EastEnder, you, you've, have, have you got anything to say on the topic? Same thing as, you know, look, I'm all, if anyone out there in our community has a problem and they want someone to speak to, you know, we're all three of us here and the boys in the back room are always here willing to help, you know, have that conversation with you to, to, to try and take away some of that pain, some of that stress that you might be carrying inside you. So never, never feel afraid to talk to us. We're here. Or, or even better, we can signpost you to actual experts in their in their fields that mm -hmm. have been um, throughout us throughout throughout the pan pandemic, throughout our community, and they've been popping up, and we didn't even know who they were. And you know, they're an expert in in some yeah. of these fields and stuff and everything. Mm -hmm. So we can point you yeah. in the right direction. Right. Last but not least, I'm looking forward to next week as well. It, it, and next week is a, this is a penultimate um, show. Next week is the last one in the series wow. until September. So let's not, you know, have them hanging on thinking that we're going away forever. We're going to come back in September with some more lives. But next mm -hmm. week is the final show. Um, and it's the season finale. And we're looking at something that is so important to us when we do events so so important it should be a promoter's first thought how are they going to protect not only the venue but how are they going to protect the people who come to their event and we've never talked to security um at all and found out what is life like as a security what do they go through you know what i mean and and bring up some of the history that we want to express throughout the street sounds history um, about being a security. So I'm looking forward to Gary and Calvin, two of our well-known security gents, um, next week. What, what about you, Reg? Yeah, I'm looking forward to giving them a disclaimer uh, to sign that they're not allowed to mention anything about uh, any what they've seen of me coming out of clubs in a drunken state. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm waiting to ask the question. What's the you know the trainer situation? You know, road trainers, ballers, trainers. You know, want to have that discussion? <laughs> yeah, they can tell you some wicked stories from text me sound about the trainer situation. So uh, yeah, it's funny because um, part of um, certain clubs' licenses is that you cannot let people in with trainers, which has got the bubbles. So if you've got bubbles in your trainers, which is most nights, and mm -hmm. some of them, you cannot be letting a club because it's part of the license can you believe yeah, but that's that? discrimination that is against against, against like, the bubbles, against, yeah? against, against, bubbles against or, bubbles. or against puma or against nike or adidas <laughs> Where's the discrimination well, we all know like? we all know that that the high proportion of black people go to places like jd sports and wear nikes and stuff like that so no, they're the ones that are not allowed to come into the club jd sports trainers yeah. yeah, you can wear the Pradas, you can wear the yeah. Balenciagas. As long as they don't have bubbles, mate. As long as they <laughs> don't have bubbles. Got bubbles. If, if they got See, bubbles, then we can't have them. Easy. So, we, so we just made security jobs easier for them. Yeah, exactly. at, if it's got bubbles, <laughs> you're not coming in. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be looking forward to talking to them um, about, you know, because you, you know what? In some instances, oh, and, and can I just yeah. say, um, um, our RIP to some of our fallen security staff and members who have given actually given their life on the doors um, for some of these events. So, yeah. you, you, you know, I think we it, it's only right that we pay homage to some of the security workers next week, Saturday here. Indeed. Indeed. On Set the Trend. So remember, Set the Trend is, is all about us trying to look at our history within the street sounds um, for, for, for fraternity chase it back to the timeline and introduce you to people who you may not know was involved with, with um, the street sounds, the rare grooves, um, the sounds like your Funkadelics, your Company Soul Sound, your Manhattans, your Mystery, your Desi G, your Barry Whites, your latest editions, um, the list, Touch a Class, the list goes on special edition. We could be here naming Fun Funky Express. We could be naming some sounds for you. Um, and that's our lineage going back to now and to born in other DJs that have followed. You know, I've been uh, I've been infused by some of the DJs in the street sounds that have gone on to do things. And um, it's a long history and we're here to catalogue that history and make sure that we give out our flowers to people who are supposed to get flowers. You know, what I mean, I think it's only due that some of them have been waiting 
30 odd years and you didn't even know how they contributed to their business at all. Reggie, that's a nice hat you're wearing. Cheers, man. You like it? <laughs> no, nah, that suits you, bro. Yeah, this is my um, this is my this, this is my DJ uh look for 2020 21. Oh wow, okay. Well, let's hope it brings as much success as the gentleman that we're about to introduce. Probably not the first street sound in, in that era, but definitely the most consistent, probably the best known, and most definitely the most successful DJ from the street sounds fraternity. In the era that gave rise to the infamous house parties of the 80s, warehouse, super clubs, Norman J. MBE, the self-confessed rare groove junkie, and the DJ that created the brand rare groove for the scene, as we know it, featuring, as I said, Mystery, Company, Manhattan, Funkadelic, and so many other sounds. A few, in fact, the, the only fault with Norman that we have is that he's a Tottenham Hotspur supporter. But apart from that, <laughs> he's not only a legend, he is without doubt one of the top five DJs in the whole of the United Kingdom. Set the trend, welcomes Norman J, MBE, to the platform. The Don is in the building. <laughs> welcome, Norma J. Yeah, welcome. That's, that's such a huge introduction. Where do, where do you go from that? <laughs> <laughs> Norman, we've yeah, been... Yeah. Norman, we've been... Uh, the, the thing is, is that the guys, we're kind of self-confessed um, historians of the whole industry, and we like to try to piece together um, our history and people who laid the foundation mm. before we came and... Your name kept popping up. We interviewed Street Sounds, you know, um, and they kept naming you as one of the their inspirations. One, one, one of the people who who kind of inspired them to play Rare Groove. Um, I think we're going to go into what Rare Groove is, or or what it was when you started playing Rare Groove, because I know Rare Groove means a lot of things to um, a lot of people. Um, yeah. But you. you <sighs> You were born, well, not you were born, your, your parents come from Gr Grenada, or that's part of your, that part of your um, heritage. Um, where did the love of soul music come from then? Was that mum or was that dad? Yeah. Dad, probably. Um, not, not probably, definitely. Um, I'm a little bit older than you guys um, and born here. And... Looking back, that gave me a distinct advantage. Um, you know, I, I've been exposed to original black rhythm and blues, jazz, um, pop, the birth of um, reggae, even before reggae, ska, um, from about 1961. Uh, I'm 64 this year, and I've been into wow. black music since I was about five. And I was buying it since I was about eight. And uh, I've got virtually every record I've ever bought since 1967. So my history goes back even further than some of the street sounds that you're talking about. Um, <laughs> I was aware of them, but where I have to say that um, I was doing that, playing black music thing since the 70s. Mm -hmm. And all of those guys came along in the in the mid 80s yes that's correct that, that's right um we're, we're going to go on to explore whether or not you actually know how big a scene it is you know that you spurned off of that um and may surprise you um because yeah. because we look at you like a long lost family member that we've heard of but we've <laughs> never been able to see or personally talk to so it's yeah. you know it's just great to have you today um wh what secondary did you what secondary school did you start off at when you I was because you're, you're original West London. Um, yeah, 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 West London. Yeah, I went to, to school in East Acton. I went to Faraday uh, mm -hmm. Comprehensive School and left there in 1973 or 74. So long that I can't really remember. So but, what was life? What so what was life like 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 for you in secondary school? Yeah, How was Norman J? Yeah. Um, uh, different to my contemporaries at the time. Um, Rudy will be able to tell you that um, I was seen as odd and, and, and weird because I, I was always surrounded by a myriad of friends mm -hmm. not just black friends white friends, Asian friends um, 
but and people in general and uh, as far as Caribbean parents go, and I'm sure you guys will be able to, to bear this out, my my parents, particularly my dad, was very liberal in his attitude and, and bringing us up and always in, encouraged us to to be inquisitive, to ask questions. And I was a very curious kid. Um, mm. Now you call them nerds. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but back in those days when something took my interest, I was seriously into whatever it was I was into um, in a fanatical way. So when it came to buying records and collecting music, um, that, that's what, what I did. I was a serious record buyer by 1970. Wow. Where did you keep your records? Okay, because, I mean, if you're like most um, Caribbean um, people at the time, um, mum would have been mad. You know yeah. me, like, <laughs> were, you, were you going with all these records? It, well, that's it. It's always the mum in it. My mum will go, well, you'll eat those records. Um, kind of half said it in jest, but half but meant it. But when she saw that it was something that I was seriously into, as opposed to most Caribbean um, parents at the time who would still spurn that and still condemn you for it, mm -hmm. I was encouraged. Yeah. You know, um, I was about eight or nine when my dad gave me a big five pound note, and it was bigger than my laptop in those days, <laughs> and trusted me to go to Shepherd's Bush, which was three miles away, on my own, on the bus, to go to the record shop to buy the records for Christmas. Wow. How many other black kids' parents would encourage them yeah. to do that? No way. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I did what, it. <laughs> what records did you come back with, Norman? Yeah, that's, that's a million dollar question, because I was always <laughs> asked, um, you know, what, what, what um, specific records. I can't remember specific records, because my job was to go out and buy a few. Um, so I bought uh, mostly reggae because I describe all that really well, um, that that childhood coming of age experience in my book. Mm -hmm. You know, I was about eight or nine. I go to Shepherd's Bush Market. Mm -hmm. I've got a big five pounds note in my pocket and I'm scared of the bigger boys taking the money off me. And you go to the record shop and it's full of what looked like big men to you. They were teenagers, mm -hmm. but they got beards and that. So you don't want to get in their way. So I remember staying by the record shop all day, listening, loving things, watching the things come in. And when everybody left about 10 minutes before the, the record shop was closing, then I went and asked them and bought the records when nobody was around. Mm -hmm. um, was right. when, when you talk about reggae, what kind of reggae? Was that the dub selection that you was buying at, no, at, at no, the no. time? This, this predates dub. I'm talking, you know, um, Skinhead Trojan, uh, music, mm -hmm. the birth mm -hmm. of reggae, Johnny Nash's You Got Soul, which came out in 68, yeah. mm -hmm. which is the first re reggae record that actually kind of uses the term reggae in that, mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. Desmond Decker, Good Israelites, um, as opposed to all the, the kind of rock steady blue beat stuff that, that came a few years before, even though yes. I was familiar with, with all of that, um, because my dad was an avid music collector. You know, my dad was a music lover. He loved everything from Tawana Brass from South America. Um, he'd buy classical music. He'd buy um, pop records, reggae records, because my grandparents were living in New York for a while in the early 60s. Um, I never met my grandmother. Um, and I, I was about four or five when I last met my paternal grandfather. But my grandfather used to send um, my dad from America um, the top three or four rhythm and blues record, R&B records in the hit parade. Wow. So I was exposed to Marvin Gaye since 1961, 62. Wow. And I already knew of all of these um, artists uh, and that, you know. I, re I remember when Millie Small went to number three in the pop charts on Ready Steady Go, singing My Boy. <laughs> you know, I can remember buying Israelites in 1968, bringing it to school, playing it on a record player, and none of us could understand what he was saying. But mm -hmm. all my white mates at that time, who were first generation skinheads um, and suede heads and, and that, because I was always into youth culture mm -hmm. and began to understand um, British youth culture's affinity with black music, not only from America, because all the mods loved original jazz. And uh, a lot of my contemporaries were just beginning to come to England in the, in the mid sixties from Jamaica, from mm -hmm. the Caribbean. You yeah. know, these were the, the older brothers and older sisters 
that, that lived with, was brought up by the grandmother, mm. you know, suddenly an older brother would appear, half sister, oh, where did they come from? <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, you know, they, they brought the culture of the music because yeah. it's, unless you were around at that time and you were old enough, it's difficult to explain how big um, reggae was in the late sixties with white working class Britain. I'm old yeah. enough to, to, to remember that. It was huge. Mm -hmm. absolutely huge and that music sold in independent record shops by the thousands yeah um but because those black owned record shops were not part of the gallop they didn't um, get recognized oh, deliberately deliberately yeah. those sales were never recorded and the, you know and the few that did break through obviously went on to chart top 10 top 20 massively um but i think for me and my record buying experience, you know, I'm only a young kid, can't afford uh, records um, really. So I took, you know, a paper round underage. Mm -hmm. I was 10, you know, uh, wow. and, and did a paper round when you, you have to be 12 or 15 to yeah. do a paper round um, to fuel my passions, which was going to football because no black kids went to football when I was going. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's you know, no black kids did a lot of things. That I was doing in those days, and that's why my community viewed me as being a bit, bit, a bit, bit, bit nerdy. Bit. Yeah. I, yeah, that first record shop. I, I was just looking for excitement, but you know, um, I, I bought what records I, I could afford until I got my first job. Um, I was an apprentice printer, which didn't last very long, because I only took a job to get the money to to buy, buy, buy my records, to buy clothes, because I was hmm. a fashion style kid. Um, <laughs> what kind of clothes was you buying at that time? What kind of brands? Yeah, um, Fred Perry, mm -hmm. Ben Sherman, mm -hmm. first time round, late 60s. Yeah, you know, wow. because all my peer group were, you know, I, and my, some of my black mates were skinheads. Mm -hmm. Original skinheads. You know? And you were fr friends, friends, friends with those guys. But they, no, they, you, were um, friends, you were friends with those skinheads. Yeah, I knew, I knew them. Okay. You know, I went to school with them. Those people used to come around my mum's house. My mum used to cook for them, feed mm -hmm. them. I played football with them every Sunday. I went to the youth clubs with them. You know. So you grew were, up, you, you was a you you obviously you're in that era when blacks used to walk on one side of the road and whites used to walk on the other side. Yeah, yeah. But no. but, but, it was, but, yeah, but that wasn't strictly true because then there was another side of the road where we got on fine. Okay. There was no, no issue. Yeah, but history, you know, and the media tends to override that, mm, you know, because I used to take enough criticism when, you know, I would have a, a St. George's flag on my bike. And, mm -hmm. you know, and people would go, you know, why have you got that NF, that National Front flag? But mm -hmm. if you knew your history, you'd understand, you know, the patron saint of England, St. George, is actually black. Mm -hmm. If you know that, then you own it. Yeah. But well, nobody can <laughs> tell you anything. You know, 100% the mm -hmm. Norman. Norman, but, but uh, th th there's a difference between a, a selector of music and a collector of music. Yeah. You didn't only buy the hits, you were, you were a collector of different genres of music mm. that, fueled your, that fueled your passion. I mean, some of, is that a room full of, I mean, that can't be all your music, so that must be either your favourite music or a favourite type of music that you have in that room. Uh. It's it's my valuable collection. It's a it's a personal collection of stuff I amass. Um, I have a virtual warehouse full of music. I've got two lockups, secret lockups around London, which is full of um, music dance records, which hmm. you know they were work records. You know, I, where, where if I'm doing a house gig, house records get played. I'm doing a Hip hop gig, hip hop records get played, doing a regular gig, regular gigs get played. You know, I think part of the reason why I was able to survive for so long because I've always been true. I'm a music lover. Mm. You know, black music, white music. Yeah, I say you in inverted commas. Mm. You put the label on it. To me, it's just music. That's what how my my dad saw it. That's how my mum saw it. Mm. So you mm -hmm. know, you'll see everything from African to Latin. To, to reggae, to, you know, my first love is soul and jazz and disco. Um, and then what became, you know, 
what the whole rare groove thing w was about because up until you know all through the 70s you know i bought um black music mm -hmm. um but never harbored any professional or amateur attitude to becoming a dj i just was a serial clubber i went out mm -hmm. As many nights a week as my budget. Where did you go? Where I did you go? Everywhere. What were the type of places that you went and raised? I went to soul boy clubs mm -hmm. um, or jazz funk or, or, or soul clubs. Um, I went to, to mod clubs. I went to jazz clubs. Um, I went to punk rock clubs. I went anywhere where there was excitement, where people congregated and enjoyed things. Um, so hold on. So what about your parties raves so what about the party time so when you didn't go a club the party yeah. raves where was you going then to hear music um i didn't really go to house parties things because that was a kind of a, uh, that was a reggae thing mm. Be because most blacks um either for the most part weren't allowed into clubs owned or run by white people that was just how it was in those days it was like an unspoken apartheid you know um you go to a club You'd hear James Brown playing, but and there's a guy putting his hand in your chest going, sorry, it's not your night. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that. <laughs> but hold on a minute, there's Marvin Gaye's playing in there, you know. You're you're playing Bob Marley music in there, but you're not allowed. And that's mm -hmm. how it was. And you know, and I went through years of that. And actually it with hindsight, it was the best thing that happened to, to me for me. Because I just thought, I'm not going to subscribe to that system. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't need to, you know, that's what it made me think. It could have turned me into an angry man. But what it did was turn me into, how am I going to get around this? You know, Babylon and the gatekeepers, they run things and think, well, ultimately, you know, I took my cues from, from the reggae scene. You know, my younger brother, Joey, was... My brother's been rusted since the early 70s. Great Tribulation sounds. Yeah, from Great Tribulation. And he built Great Tribulation. I wasn't there in the beginning because I didn't relate. Yeah, and it's I'm honest, I didn't relate to the Jamaican sound system culture at all. Um, it wasn't something that I was interested in. You know, I kind of stopped buying reggae really... Um, when the whole sort of um, Trojan thing ended about 72, 73, mm. because then I realized my great love was Philadelphia music. Um, you know, I loved all the, all the Motown stuff. I bought loads of stack stuff, small labels. Salso. Stuff. You know, yeah, but Salso wasn't even out yet. Right. Um, you know, I bought the first Salso records when they came out in 74, 75. Um, you know, and a lot of things. People kept asking me, you know, years later, well, how come you have so many old records? Well, the only way to have old records really is to buy them new. Because I wasn't a music snob, I would just buy what I, I could afford. But the, the real turning point came in 1979 when um, I went to New York for the first time. Um, the first record and tape opened Luckily for me, it was in, in Goldhawk Road, uh, just, you know, two miles from where I lived. Mm -hmm. And it, the, 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 most of the shop was run by these punk guys. They had all the punk things. So black people never went in there. Mm -hmm. So one day, out of curiosity, I've just come back from playing Sunday football for my pub team. We got dropped off at Goldhawk Road. I'm walking up the road. I think, I'm going to take So I go in there, just curious. And I go do you guys sell any black music, you know, to punks and goths? And he went, yeah, mate, all the black music's in the basement. If I go down in the basement in this shop, my God. <laughs> Keep in the sweet shop. You could buy everything. There. And because up until that point, I'll, I'll be honest, I was a singles buyer and a few, twelve because, you know, I'm a kid. I spent most of the 70s employed, unemployed, getting my gyro. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I wasn't, yeah. uh, I, I wasn't a villain and I didn't sell drugs, I wasn't a crook, I wasn't a car stealer, I didn't do radios, I was just an honest working kid. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the money to do that. So when I go to this shop now, um, there's all these R and B, well, yeah, R and B soul jazz albums in the basement because 
what I subsequently learned was that all the record companies were based in and around Hammersmith. I don't know if you, you remember yeah. the record, yeah. 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 just up the road. Yeah, sure. And all the record companies' promos and that, that the radio people didn't want, they used to give it so, to record and play. And because it, no one knew what to do with the black records, they just went in the basement. And I was the first person to discover this Aladdin's cave. So I go there, and there's all these James Brown albums from Polydor Island, all these things you could buy for 50p. Wow, 50p. So because I had the knowledge of thinking, well, I've got these singles. I was a singles collector, but that's all okay. I could afford. I said, oh, I know this single, got this single, got that single. For a quid or 50p, the album's got to be worth a pint. Got, that's right, exactly. So yeah. Educating yourself because I couldn't afford the album. And in, in, a, in a year, I managed to find every James Brown album that I knew of but could never <laughs> buy a new. Wow. You even went to I America. I Bob Marley for you, all my Marley albums. You went to all America. The records, all oh. the gate files. You, went, you, you know. went to America to look for records as well. Not to look for records. Um, it was somewhere, you know, in those days, you know, America might as well have been Mars, especially as a young black working class kid who had no job. Mm. You know, 1979, Thatcher just come to power, winter of discontent, um, the NF are on the march. You know, the Brixton riots are only an hour, you know, a year away. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and England wasn't, you know, a great place to be trying to survive as a young black youth. As I've told the BBC many times, you know, I was 16, young and angry. August 76, when carnival riots happened, you know, front row with my stick, bottles, fighting the beast, fighting the Babylon. Um, same like Don Letts. Yeah. And because my memory is, and my recall was vivid. You know, I'm a lifelong teetotaler, never drank, never been drunk, don't do drugs. So my recall of events mm -hmm. is, is, is well, was total. And, you know, and I lived through that and I under, understood the wider political implications of that because in the late 70s, early 80s, I was properly switched on politically, very left. Um, you know, a lot of my punk friends were, were the same. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, going on the anti-fascist marches, um, the only, looking back, one march I wish I'd, I'd gone on but didn't um, was after Fine for the, course, the, the fire in New Cross when I was poor kids got, mm. got, got yeah. burnt to death in New Cross. Yeah. And I just thinking, you know, my sisters could have been there because they used to yeah. go to a lot of parties in their round. Yeah. Yeah, you know, thinking, you know, I was working in Southall at the time when Blair Peach died, you know, the Australian teacher who was on the front of the anti Nazi march. I remember we were sent home work early from work um, because the skinheads were coming to support a skinhead band, or you know, right wing band in Southall, and all the all the Asians in Southall got together and went, they're not going to allow the, the, the NF to march through Southall. And they came, and they got rinsed out, and that Hamburg Hamburg Tavern pub got burned down. I mean, I don't know if you, well, you guys probably aren't old enough, but this was headline news at the time. Wow. You know, and this was all a precursor to what happened in Brixton in 1981. Yeah. You know, yeah. Again, I'm, I'm old yeah. enough, I'm young enough, understand what's going on. Can't get to Brixton because the police got on the platform at Stockwell. All the black kids, you're not going any further. They threw a ring around it to stop because we were coming from Labrick Grove, we were coming from Hackney, you know, we were coming from Islington to help brothers and sisters in Brixton. <laughs> wow. You know, and this is all unreported kind of, you know, I'm a frontline, you know, eyewitness news, you know, watching all of that. Wow. Norman, um, to today, I know people just best have their ears listening because we aren't going to have enough time to talk about how what we we i just know we've i've got so many questions here to go through for you there's and a part two of september then isn't there yeah thank you this, <laughs> that's, oh, what you to, that. that's what i wanted to guarantee thank yeah. you um but pause right there we have a, a special guest here yeah. we have for you um a gentleman um others may know him 
as one of um, the founders of the group, um, Young Disciples, and know the iconic song, Apparently Nothing. Can we bring one of your longtime friends to set the trend, Femi Femme, in the building? Hey. Come in, man, hey. <laughs> Howdy, buddy, sir. <laughs> How are yes, you, Femi? Yes, yes. Well, 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 Femi well, welcome to set the trend. Femi is one of All my right. students. One of my students who I'm proud of. Who came good. <laughs> <laughs> one of my original students. That's a fact. <laughs> Femi, how did you meet? Proud, though. <laughs> Femi, how, Femi, how did you meet Norman? Norman, Norman was um, I. I think I knew about um, GT sound system. As we were then, yeah. As they were, yeah. yeah. It was GT, and a friend of mine at school, a guy called Alex Selby. Mm. He's Karaku like Norman. It's Karakou, right, Norman? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Because right, the guy yeah. said Grenada yeah. earlier. Yeah, well, Grenada, Karakou, because all the islands. I know, are I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Too far from each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and his his family were like close to Norman. So so Norman Norman's no, no, um he had a a flat. His, his sister had a flat that was gonna um they were that she was vacating mm. and somehow we managed to persuade Norman to come and bring his sound to uh, to have this party. And it must have been 1985. Yeah, it was. I remember it the, was. Big, the big tune of the night, I'm yeah. going to tell Norman, I'm going to expose Norman now. The big tune of the night was Hanging on a String. That's and these right. guys, Ooh. the guys actually, there must have been a, a, a lull because they hadn't been using the system for a while mm. and a couple of times in the night the system broke down mm. uh, but Norman was a class DJ from day one he knew exactly <laughs> what to do and every time he, he signed back on we signed on with that yeah and it was as if nothing had happened I mm. just rolled and I kept I, I, I clocked that from day one. Femi, oh, wow. what were some of the places amazing. that you Femi, what were some of the places that you went with Norman to listen to music when he wasn't playing? Well, actually it wasn't that kind of situation, you know. It really was a, a time because this, this is in the mid eighties when we were just we just got to a state where it was, I'd say it's like a, a crossroads, you know, and it was it was all about creating something and well, well, building it was, something. It was a generational thing because Femi's generation, Femi, couldn't they, uh, Selby, all, this was the generation that came after me. You know, I, I'm really 70s clubbing, 70s partying, 70s everything, youth culture, mm -hmm. politics, mm -hmm. Um, you know, because by the 80s, I've already had two chew, you know, I've become a dad, I've got two kids. Um, we didn't, had to persuade Norman, yeah, D didn't we think persuade him was, was really going anywhere. And and then Alex Selby said, Listen, I'm having a party, um, in this house in Acton, and I still pass that house and the fondest memories, you know, mm -hmm. and in there. And, and what made me feel great and really inspired me was to see a younger generation like Femi's. Because up until then, the, the black music scene in the UK was a bit disparate, not really going anywhere. Um, records weren't that great. Um, and then this party, there was black, white, Asian, real mix and a real appreciation of music that was close to my heart. That Because I wasn't really DJing then. I'm still a record collector. In 1985, I was a record hustler. I was selling records to collectors. Um, <laughs> Bump and hustle music. Yeah. But, you know, but that, was, that was all to come. But then <laughs> you, you meet an audience of kids, which is what Femi and that were, um, that was open to everything that I was trying to show people. Because I guess I must have been a, a latent, um, frustrated DJ. Um, so, and, Femi, so, Femi, so in terms of... Did you notice that with Norman at the time? Was you trying to persuade him to go down the road of taking it well, more this, serious? This is, a, 
this is the thing. Norman had this. I'd never seen a record collection before. Then. <laughs> I'll go into this vault. And I know you guys, that's what you guys were trying to find out from Norman. I go into this vault and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> I remember on the day, it was the first time I heard a song. It was the first time I heard One Ads by Honeycomb. By the honeycomb. Mm. First time I heard um, there's this tune that's a very Norman J tune called Mary Hartman. So it's like a disco tune. Yeah. And I couldn't believe that this music was just here. You know, I heard, I think I heard Just Us that day as well. Yeah. And I'm like, what is this? All this crazy music. I mean, I was speaking to, to Reggie earlier. I said, you know what? At that time, for me, don't let love get you down. Archie Bell in the drills. Norman, right? Yeah. I mean, he might not see it like that. But for me, that was Norman because it was the Philly thing. Hmm. It was a two step. They called and it, it was funky. Yeah. And it but worked black, for everybody. black people was really into that. The black, the black reggae crossover scene at the time as a yeah. scene that went on to, to adopt the slower end of the music. Mm -hmm. And rebrand it as real. That was still that That's was right. slow enough for them. <laughs> yeah, of course it That's was. That's why it was still, you know, that maybe eighties ladies, but that particular it crossed over from Lovers Rock. Exactly. Yeah, it's a Lovers Rock connection. It was that, but but we also <laughs> we also I know what Norman was also he was happy with us. Me and my brother Tunji, mm. us we kept on badgering him for the funk. We were hearing the funk right. being played in. Some West End places. The beat, white boy funk. That's what you were hearing, and you were bored of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was that. There was that as well. But there was there was there was also some some some, you know, like what Lascelles was playing as well. Yeah. And 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 Norman had had tunes that were like that, different. And it was just a, a mind blowing experience of just finding out all this music. Now, it's not exclusive to any one person. As we know, the scene is, but it's about how you use it and mm. how you, we were all about, as Norman, we were versions of what Norman was, was. we came with a totally cosmopolitan That's view. Right. Yeah. It wasn't about being black. No, nah, it wasn't. People, obviously we were proud of ourselves. I'm African. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, that, that. That's not something that we needed to wear on our sleeve. What we wore on our sleeves was the fact that we could own what we wanted. And we, we went out there. We, we, we met with a lot of really cool white kids, yeah. Asian, mm. like the guys from the brand new heavies, yeah. um, obviously later on Jamiroquai, but mm. all of these people. And... There's a lot of people like that that come from our little corner of West London. But it was just because we were open-minded to really having a good time. Yeah. I mean, and it, it before, I think what needs to be said is, is that because um, Femme and I used to have these very deep conversations. You remember Femme. Yeah. It was about um, how we maintain control of what we were doing. Um, because my generation had it ripped off them in the 70s. You know, we were just the dancing mm -hmm. monkeys. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't run the clubs, we didn't run the parties, we weren't the DJs. You know, we were invisible. We were just the we just provided the soundtrack. So come the 1980s, when I meet people like Femi and other like-minded people, this is how we're gonna do it. But we will be visible. You know, which is why I called my show on Kiss the original Rare Groove show. Ah, I'm old enough you remember. Ah, ah. yes. So everything that comes after that came from this this show, the original Rare Groove show. So, so hold on a minute. You see, this is where we get quite interesting, yeah. especially for street sounds, especially yeah. for the Rare Groove street sounds that mm. came after you. Mm. What? Let's start with what kind of music was you playing at the time that was came under the auspices of Rear Groove? Just um, basically anything you couldn't readily buy in the shop. Mm -hmm. 
was rare group. Okay. Anything. It, it, it meant that you just couldn't go into your R price and go, um, can I buy this album from 1974? Or can I go into record and tape and can, can you sell me this track, independent soul track from 1981? Rare Groove was all of that. But then you don't control what people like. Mm. You know, when I first started off, this is why I created an alter ego called Shake and Finger Pop. Mm -hmm. You know, Good Times was what went on to be, you know, the, the DNA of the, of the sound system culture where you guys come from. Um, because none of that music was new. All things like Shake It Up, you'd have heard me playing Shake It Up in 1977. Yeah. But they weren't new records to me. Um, but well, where I was fortunate is that in, in the mid, from the mid 80s onwards, the biggest single thing was I had a platform, Pirate Radio. Mm -hmm. If there was no Pirate Radio, there'd have been no rare groove. Wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. But all of that music, I was playing on the radio. So you could hear it every Saturday for about four or five years, between one and three, and I'd touch it. And let me just show you something. I just went around my parents' house for the first time in weeks today, and my mum found this. Wow. Oh, my God. This is an exclusive on Set the Trend. <laughs> Jesus. This is virtually every show from Kiss from 1985. Oh my god. Wow. That is wow. amazing. Norman, so, you, I need remember, to go, you know when Norman used to do the shows for the week, for the week afterwards, I'll be I'll be riding around in the car with him and Norman would be analysing his shows. <laughs> Just like and I'll be listening to tune after tune. In fact, it made me lazy. I didn't get the tunes until years after I left Norman. <laughs> <laughs> the tunes were just there. I would never claim. I would never claim responsibility for, 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 for breaking these tunes because, you know, all you guys have taken it to another deeper level, which just wasn't for me. I'd done my job. All I had to do was lay the path, and then you Enjoy lot could, could go. Where, where yeah, you but wanted. Norman, Norman, are you aware of you gave us a brand? Yeah, first and foremost, you you gave us a brand which was Rare Groove. Are you aware of how big that scene came? It became because obviously you 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 left. Hand on heart, no. Um, I just hear anecdotally that it, it's massive, but you know, hand on heart, it was never my scene. Uh, uh, really, in in the in the purest sense of the Rare Groove thing, because um, for me, you know, age and experience always taught me that when you follow these things you're basically going down a dead end. You leave yourself nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And because I like so many other styles of music, yeah. you know, I, I really wasn't, you know, pigeon the, the with scene, without, wishing, yeah. without wishing to denigrate it, it's yeah. the black version of the Northern Soul scene, mm -hmm. dominated by collectors of, of stuff for the most part. You know, I wouldn't give two pence for those records, personal opinion. Mm -hmm. They do nothing for me. <laughs> it's all about... Hear that, Michael. <laughs> no, but, uh, it's not, I'm coming for his tape collection. I'm coming for his tape collection. That's the new rear group. It's all about, it's all about boys, mostly boys, um, being alpha. You know, my dick is bigger than your dick. My mm -hmm. record is rarer than yours. Mine oh. costs mm -hmm. more than yours. You know, it's this kind of... I come from an entertainment standpoint. I want to make as many people enjoy the our music culture as possible. You know, if they if they have, if they need three records in the world, um, and that doesn't help the artist. That that helps you. That makes your head swell. That makes your dick long because why? I'm the only one playing this rarity thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a sound system culture thing on the black. On the other side of that, this, that's what the white blokes do with Northern Soul. Mm -hmm. You know, some of those records that cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. <sighs> You know, I would rather play a pop record that everybody knows and loves than be, you know, if I could play you records, I could sit here and boast, but I could play you records you've never heard, you will never hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Play like anything there, I'll show you records you've never seen before. But that's not the point. So, so you've got spreading our history. Some of those are, but even some of those are good records. So. Yeah. So, but I, I, I'm not really going to have that from Norman. Well, it, it, it's about quality. 
yeah, and yeah. I believe, and I believe that Norm, I believe yeah. that Norman definitely he he his whole thing was about quality. Mm. So mm -hmm. if it started becoming about mm. what Norman rightly did say, yeah, about about entertaining, people, yeah, and competing and mm. covering records and stuff, yeah. that wasn't about the entertainment. No. But there was good records, and some of them are expensive. Yeah. That's the way it goes. It's supply and demand. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, you, of course, that's what I said. I never sit here and go, yeah, I dug out or exposed every rare groove record that, that you went. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, I went to some of Funkadelic's um, parties because I was hearing so much of, of, about this thing and a few of those other sounds, you know. Ganker, kind of yeah. There. Yeah, and think, I heard one or two records I've never heard before. I heard several records I already had, but they're playing, they're, they're exposing those records to a completely different crowd. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, right, I can yeah. remember playing one Street Sounds gig. I don't know if any of you guys are there. This would have been shortly after 85, 86 at a town, Hammersmith Town Hall. Um, mm. There's about four or five sounds there. A big South London promoter who used to promote on that scene put all our sounds together. Rudy might have been there. <laughs> but I, I remember getting fed up and then playing the same old Archie Bell records, Yawn Yawn. Um, and uh, you know the, the records there were there's no creativity in that mm -hmm. they just got a formula they all use the formula and you know that me for me the punk rock community yeah. fuck this i remember playing I, was there, Norman. I remember playing <laughs> message from the soul sisters that was one of the earliest times i ever took it out and played it and it killed the dance dead and then i was so angry i got on the mic and said in the fucking year all you lot will wish you had this record. <laughs> <laughs> and then how big did message from the South Sisters become? Yeah, massive. Norman, 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 but saying that, but 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 saying that, Norman, some of your anthems were um Buttercup, Secret Rendezvous, Barely Breaking Even. Those were some of your anthems, though, wasn't they? Which yeah, which yeah, you they, loved they I got bored of playing those records because you know, if 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 you're one of those people that just follows what everybody else does and succumbs to your crowd, mm. um, then you have to walk away from it or do something different. You know, how many times do you want to keep hearing those records when I'm sitting on thousands of records that sound like it and, and no one wants to hear it? Then And you know what's so interesting? A lot of people would say that um, the street sound scene or the black street sound scene is exactly that. When we first yeah. launched this podcast, we did a thing called the Top 100. And there was it was based on a lady who was complaining that the um, DJs were playing the same records in the yeah. gigs in the same order. So it's interesting that you say that, that you made that transition. Mm -hmm. from yeah. Well, I left that. I saw that what, what was happening. And thanks to, um, you know, surrounding myself with younger people like Femi, like Kunle, you know, like Michael Ball, all, all the Eden boys who had a slightly different perspective mm -hmm. and were much more open. That's why I couldn't play on the reggae scene. That's why I don't play on the northern scene. You know, have you ever asked yourself why the, the northern soul scene doesn't have a well-known or high-profile black DJ? Yeah. yeah. Never. Yeah. Why you know? do you think it doesn't have one? Um, because I don't want to subscribe and perpetuate all the nonsense that goes on with it. Which you is, know, um, um, one upmanship, you know, it, it's full of record collectors who are not crowd entertainers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but, there's a, but there's a difference between connectors and entertainers, yes? Well, yeah, because very few people have managed to make both work. Okay. You know, the most boring DJs are the record collector DJs. <laughs> They're not the entertainers, that's right. Yeah. They're not the entertainers. You ask any girl. No girl stands in the dance where there's a record collector who's playing a record that costs 100 quid or labels. See you later. <laughs> Norman, I'm just crying with laughter. You just come on in and talk the things. Oh, it's the <laughs> truth. It is the truth, though. Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard this. But, I, mean, I, heard this. No, but I don't condemn it. You still, yeah. for all its faults, you still need that end of the scene. Mm -hmm. You know, 100%. Yeah. It, it's ours, it's black. And it's traditional and very conservative. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very conservative scene. They don't like change. So they know what they know. Like I used to say to, to them lot back in the day, you know, our, our, our people are, you know, we're keepers of tradition because we're scared of change. Mm 
Mm -hmm. We're the last to get into something. We're never the first to get into something. We're the last to get it, but when we get it, it stays with us. Yeah. So does that mean does that mean Norman you you wouldn't play a, a rear groove set for for the for the streets? I've st I've, st I've deliberately steered clear of that. I don't do gigs where where I, I, that they want me to come and just do that. You know, I did that you know thirty years ago, and I did it successfully for for a long time. You know, and if you've just come and you're running with it, that's your thing. Fine, I'm happy mm -hmm. with that. You know, mm -hmm. other things interest me because my whole attitude as a god is is quite punk rock. You know, on my Sunday show, I play a lot without apologizing for it. You know, a lot of my favorite rock songs. I've never <laughs> yeah. been able to do that before. Yeah, I, I love. You know, I, I know it. I was the first black DJ to come there and play them their music back at them. Yeah. You know, at Carnival, I play the Clash. I play Thin Lizzy. You know, I play the small faces. I play mm -hmm. Rod's. I love all of them. And I don't feel the need now to justify it. Just as I play much more reggae now than I have done in 40 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Tell him, wow. Norman. Norman, do you know what I'm going to ask you? Because you know, as a DJ, what comes with that? When you're breaking new ground and um, you're trying to do something new and different, what comes with that is that people stand, people leave the dance floor, people might... Yeah. People might boo you, actually. Yeah. yeah. How, yeah. how have you happened. dealt with that and how did you deal with that? Because you've also played tunes that people come on to like, like Mr. Yeah. Fix It. I've done my research. I know that you was one of the first um, mm. DJs to play Mr. Fix It by Jeffrey um, back in the days. So mm. how did you deal with that kind of situation? Or how do you deal with that, should I say? It's, it's about programming, isn't it? And understanding people. It ain't about the record label. You know, it's what pushes the emotional buttons of, of people. What makes girls think this is a great record? You know, the, the best judges of music on your dance floor are your sisters, your mm -hmm. women folk, because it's uncomplicated with them. I hate to refer to them in that tense, yeah. but, but they either, you mean. Or, yeah. or, or they don't. Yet mm -hmm. blokes have, feel the need to criticize, to validate themselves. <laughs> you know, uh, for me, you know, one of the rules, lifelong rules as a DJ was make friends with your dance floor as quickly as possible. <laughs> That's right? a great saying. Make great friends saying. with your dance floor as quickly as possible. Your music is only as appealing as to yeah. the least interested person in the room. You know, only blokes use the word cheesy. <laughs> Girls don't see the word cheesy. <laughs> when you understand those little dynamics, yes. you'll have a career. Okay, and one of the guys that you definitely uh, make uh, make friends on the dance floor with is um a certain Rudy Ranks. Yeah, oh, my compadre and brother in arms. Yeah, Rudy. Is Rudy around? Rudy, he's yeah. he's here. He's here, and we got to see him cooking. Rudy Ranks, where you been, mate? Where you been? Yeah, Rudy. I've been there, I've been there listening. Yeah. Now, Rudy's my connection with the street scene. Rudy is the tr Rudy Norman J is the true fella. He's he's being very modest tonight. I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> I'm hearing. Even, I'm, I'm even, hearing Femi, I'm, even Femi will say he's being very modest Rudy. tonight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing. I'm hearing things for the first time. I'm hearing Norman say things for the first time that I've never heard him say before. It's a. This is a, a fantastic interview. <laughs> yeah, it's just Rudy, a big... Rudy, just quickly before we got a break, because we have. Um, Raheem Devon in the in the background, and we're going to just bring him on. We're not going to get rid of any of you guys. We're going to we're going to bring him on in a sec. Rudy, how did you first meet Norman J? I was um I was a whippersnapper. I had my own little sound in Acton, West London. What's the name of the town? Provident. 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 Yeah, yeah it was just a little party. You know, one of them little a christening. <laughs> It was a it was a it was a blues dance happening, mm. blues party. This was around the time when Norman was just starting to to to, to feature on GT. Good great time, tribulation, which was oh, great, oh, great privilege. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. And I was strung up in one room. They were strung up in another room. I mean, sound quality and music. It was a different level. They, these guys were bigger and older and wiser than me. You know what I mean? But I was just there doing my little thing. That's how, that was the initial meeting, and then I remember speaking to um, both Norman and Joe after, and they just said, Charlie, really, why don't you just, just come, man? And I just thought, you know what? Yeah. And I just sort of, like, 
forgot, left my little set and just jumped on board. <laughs> so was that good times or was that great tribulation? Good time. This was like the, the, the birth of good times. Good times. So what qualities did you see in Norman at that time? Because obviously if someone's offering you something, you have to see something that's worth, you know, getting in bed with at that time. What qualities did you see in... <sighs> The guy's a legend. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, he's a legend, musical legend. I, I would honestly say that he's one of my mentors, musical mentors, you know, that, that has given me consistently up until today, you know, I still learn things from Norman, you know, about music, about presentation, going on gigs, watching how he handles crowds, whether it be in a hall, whether it be at a corporate function or whether it be at a stadium. You know, again, Fevy's here. He will tell you the same. Good really, to see. I just wanted to. I just I wanted... Reggie's been Reggie's been dying to get on top of that bus for the longest time. There. <laughs> <laughs> right, mate. Right. Really, right. really, <laughs> really, <laughs> really, <laughs> really right. hearing Rudy say that made me just think about like meeting Norman, and it was the fact that Norman was easy to say, "Come in." Yeah. He wasn't. It wasn't, and he wasn't. It wasn't. No, there was nothing official about that. He did. Norman did this thing where he would have one, any one of one of us young ones with him, rolling about. I went to every record shop with him, met big suits that helped me further later on in my career. And I, I could, I could see that obviously the similar thing happened with Rudy there. It's yeah, very, there's so much. I mean, obviously it would take a lot longer than the time that we have now yeah. to go through and. Well, you know, Rudy, Rudy, we're coming back for part two. Norman's already promised us, and it won't be on a Saturday night either, so he'll have no, <laughs> no excuse to join us. Um, this conversation, I think, I, you know, it kind of similar to a conversation that I think some of the comedy greats had the other day with Eddie Murphy, where they sat down and they just listened to Eddie Murphy. Some of the new comics, Dave Chappelle and all those new guys, they listened to Eddie Murphy just talk. And this is just like one of those conversations and I'm so honored to be here. But just pause a minute. I have another legend. Um, and, oh. and there's legends. Norman is a super legend. So let's just make sure that he knows that he's in a category by himself. <laughs> but we have a legend here coming. He, he's a gentleman that um, I first met in, two th me and EastEnder first met in 2004. For, and we first in, in interviewed him on Baseline FM and he's just gone from strength to strength and some of his music I'm sure Norman's going to have an opinion on on some of the, the style of his music because it's right up your street can set the trend please welcome Raheem Devon to the building please <laughs> Raheem <laughs> Devon <laughs> <laughs> the love king is in the building what's, up, you, uh, what's going on how y'all doing I'm good. I'm good. I know you've been in the back um, listening. I'm sorry that we've had to keep you waiting for a, for um, a little bit. But as we said, there's a super legend here, one of the top five of all time greatest um, DJs, club DJs, um, festival DJs, whatever, however you describe him. In, in Globally, business, man. In, in, in the business. Um, Raheem, we've got you for a little time as well. You, you ain't running anywhere, are you? Actually, I am. No, <laughs> no, no, no don't no, say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I promise I will come back. I'll do a full thing for you guys. Um, a turn of events. I do got to make it to. I, I got to make a flight to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, um so, okay. but I'm, I'm here, so let's do it. You know. Okay. So, R Raheem, you've got. Um, I mean, you've got some anthems, haven't you? For the for the for the for the, for the club. I mean, a few. A few you know, first, big up to all. Days out there, days make the world go round. Norman, I believe I had the opportunity to perform um, a few times. I was over. Um, Sorry, your, your mic's chipping it out, you know, Raheem. Different. Coming. <laughs> but, yeah. Good? How's that? Go on. If you carry on talking, it's just going in and out while, while you talk for a minute. Okay, yeah. So, um, but, uh, what I was saying, I believe I had the opportunity to see him perform, you know. Um, by, you know, by way of Jazzy Jeff and Kenny Dope, Masters, those guys, festivals like that, and I like room hot, go to different areas. You know? <laughs> big, big up DJs, DJs keeping the world um, vibrant and keeping keeping the culture alive on all genres of music. 
Cool. Raheem, you've got some songs for us then, because if you've got to get a plane, I know I don't want to. I, I do want to keep you, but I don't want to keep you. Uh, well, I, I ain't gonna be selfish. I want to extend the invitation to come back, man, and get it up with you guys. But um, I do have my ninth album coming out. Um, you know, in June, June fourth to be exact. You can pre-order the album, and I know, I know, I, I I personally heard through the grapevine that this was one of you guys' personal requests right here. So let's see. See. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna do it for you right. You know what I mean? Like one time for the one time, like right now. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here on the show with you guys. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Shopping spree, yeah. Wow. Uh, a man's supposed to keep you pampered, yeah. Eee. Toss you a brand new key to a ride parked outside. Cause when you ain't even ask him, yeah. Hey, oh, look here. Yeah. I'm the type to run your bath water. Ooh, I'm the type to rub your feet. I'm the type to rub your feet. I'm the type to cook a home cooked meal for you, shorty. And break you up with baby face whip a pill. Have mercy, cause I know when a man. When a man, when a man loves his God, his God. You see, he'll do anything that he will to show her that she is his wife. When a man, so think of me as a great. No, I never been Captain Saber. Ooh, I never been. Oh no. Well, let me show you what I know, Miss Lady. If you give me your hand, I'll show you diamonds are a girl's best friend. Yeah. Say, here you go, baby. Now, play now. If you're the type of right shotgun, ooh, I can take you, pick you out of wine and done you. Favor. Ooh, if you don't know what you deserve, baby, well, I'm going to take it by myself to take off the blood. When a man, when a man, when a man loves his guy, see, he'll do anything. Yes, he will to show her that she is right. When a man, when a man, when a man, when a man. One time, shout out to everybody in the UK right now. You know, it's that late midnight hour was approaching. And listen, they call me many, many things, but the love king of RB, Mr. Sue Jones, Mr. Jiggy, Mr. Conscious, the lip god, but you can call me Mr. Midnight. Listen, when it up in the midnight hour, yeah. After 12, when you're by yourself, when you're in need of sexual help, I'll be there pronto. Just need to go home. Pour that water like that jug. Lay that little hill like that new day. Have way out my drawers. While you climb the wall. When you need a sound door, baby. I'll cook and cross. Let me be your Mr. Midnight. Just call me baby. That's who I 
Give us no chance to stop. We gon' keep on going. From like 12 on one. Till like 6 in the morning. You're like summer rain. Pouring down in the center. When you leave by the heat. In the dead of the winter. The moon is shining through the blast. I thought I hit it from behind now. I do you want it back downtown? What up the sheets up the town? I wear up my drawers, baby. So you're screaming, Lord, baby. When you need a sound, oh, baby. And I'll call it a boss, baby. Let me be, let me be, let me be. You know I got to give you one classic from the first album that set the whole tone. I believe the year was 2005, man. You remember the Love Experience album? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Every line, every phrase, oh, it's going to be for you. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, 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 Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, the play. Go on, go on, Ryan. What's it? take y'all back right now if you can support me for over you know 10 15 years now going on 20 we got all eight albums i appreciate the love out there right now once again i'm the love to the one be right here the one live on remote washington dc and it feels it's a pleasure to be here with y'all right now it's a pleasure indeed and i look forward to coming back <laughs> thank you thank you, thank you. Yeah, it looks like you're taking all the ladies with you tonight, yeah. Raheem. <laughs> <laughs> Raheem, so before you go, when can we get your album? Your new album is going to be out soon. Can you tell us when it's out and where can we purchase it? So briefly, first and foremost, I just released an album back in November. It's called uh, What a Time to Be in Love. It's album number eight. It was produced by the colleagues and good friends of mine in Atlanta. Um, this next album is produced by Apollo Brown. Big shout out to, you know, Apollo Brown out of Detroit, Michigan, um, you know, well known in the hip hop movement underground. And um, man, we, we, we knocked out this album probably in about 14 days or so, you know, um, minus just the wow. label, the mixing and the mastering and the whole vibe. And, you know, um, Win a Man, which I felt like was a great um, lead, lead buzz single, you know, virally off of, the, off of the project. We just released another song, Zaddy, as well. Uh, when I come back for y'all next time, I'll be sure. <laughs> Have you got any tour dates yet, Raheem? Because we, because you know we love to see you in London town. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm have looking, you got any tour dates signed you, and sealed already? Well, you know, with COVID, they're trying to figure it out. We're trying to be bouncing some ide ideas on dates and stuff of that nature and venues. But uh, I would just say, in the meantime, follow me on social media so that you know when I'm coming, you know, to the London, to the UK and surrounding areas, man. I'm looking forward to coming back. Uh, yeah, again, you can pre-order the album Love Sick on all the digital platforms. Okay. Check out that new single, Zaddy, and, 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 and Win a Man. Raheem is, Raheem. Reggie here. Ra Raheem is Reggie Styles here. I just want to say big up and salute. Um, it'll be, it was a pleasure to be part of doing your promo back in the Sony days. Oh, and, man. Uh, I remember us bumping into Tier and Re <laughs> in um, uh, Wagamama's Camden, the yeah. footballer, just before you were doing the show. Absolutely. So, uh, big up. Good to Good to see you, man. Love him. <laughs> Raheem, don't Raheem. be a stranger. Thank you for coming on the show, and we will see you very soon. Absolutely. Love to come back, man. Blessings to everybody in here. Let's keep the music culture alive. Are you talking about house music? Are you talking about rock? Are you talking about you know R&B and soul or hip-hop and the culture? Um, again, without platforms like this and the DJs that are here and the DJs that we all know of, um, let's keep it alive. Like, it's very important. Um, big love and respect to everybody. Peace. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Raheem. Thank you. Pleasure. Raheem Devon in the building there. Norman, you probably yeah. know every oh, no. little... Sorry, Ray, every before, little tune. Ray, before okay. you go on, sorry. Uh, Femi's got a run, but um, it, Femi, you got a new EP 
Eye of the High. Yes, come in, Phil. Yeah. Excellent. So, Norman, uh, have you heard that? I think I've heard one. You have to come stronger. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still <on> <laughs> Well, Femi Fem, thank you very much. And obviously, Fem, you're going to be back. Still playing the YDs. Hey, Fem, I'm going to back you up. Still the YDs, yeah. Fem, still the YDs, mate. Yeah. I mean, you set such a high bar. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Bar. Well, we got more coming to you, Norman. With Raheem's track, you know, the very first track was that uh, 40 days, 40 nights. We used to use that as kiss of the, that break as a bed. Yes. <laughs> And, and, I, I was about to say, Norman, you could probably tell us of every sample that is used in every in, in, in one of the tunes, no, right? I, I've got an old man's memory. I can't. <laughs> I can't <remember>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Femi Fen, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Femi. Fen. Awesome. Um, hopefully, we can get you back on as well. Nice, so big up, Norman. Big up. You yeah. guys are doing yeah. an amazing way. job here. Yeah. Oh, no, in a oh, train. Yeah. Femi, you're on the radio tomorrow as well, yes? Yes, I That's am indeed. What time? What time can they Seven catch you? Seven till nine. Seven till nine. Myself. There my you soul. go. Catch Femi. Cool. Femi. Yeah. Yeah. In there. All, All right, Femi. Me. Thanks Big a lot. Up, Rudy. Big up the crew. Norman. Thanks, Femi. Yeah. Keep it moving. Original shaken finger pop. The real. For real. No, because you know, because you know, I doff my hat to to you, Femi, and you, Rudy, because you were there. From the beginning, I watched how everything unfolded because we always had a plan. It wasn't just a random thing. It might look random and easy to everybody else, but we always had a plan. We always knew what we were doing. But the most important thing, we were always in control of what we were doing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. we are, so we're, well, we're still trying to keep that control. Yeah. yeah. Well, we so, are. Through these guys doing this, mm -hmm. which is the reason why I agreed to, to take part and, and support it. You know, we never had these opportunities. You know, I had to nearly get arrested so we could start Kiss FM. You know, mm. so you, in fact, you you not only helped out as a DJ and you was part of that, but you helped out financially to help keep Kiss FM as it was back in the day um, on the road. Or we may well, never have heard about anything about it. We so close to, you know, we were within 12 hours of just unfolding forever. You know, the, the course of history was changed because um, me and my brother sat down and thought, do we put into this? Because we were George Power's last hope amongst our group. You know, George exhausted all these other avenues of getting external finance. Gordon had run out of money. Tosca had run out of money. Um, and we just done a couple of shows where we made a little bit of money. So I had to make a, a decision, you know, do I put it into to KISS so we, the station goes on this weekend or not? It was that close. So we put the money in, Joey and I, um, and the rest is history. You know, Gordon managed to get it together and George to refinance it. But if it's true. If we hadn't put the money in that weekend, you know, Wow. Norman, I'm quite interested because um, the way that you talk and you're a straightforward guy, I, you know, I get that you, you, you know, the truth hurts in some aspects. And I, and, and I think being around somebody like you, 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 you could only excel if you listen to the way you're, you're teaching. Mm -hmm. You try to get a group of DJs together at your house to talk about the culture as it was then. Um, some of you guys, I know one of the guys was our own Chris Sweeney from RJS, um, who was there. Who was some of the other gentlemen that you had around your house to kind of had have that conversation? And what was that conversation aimed well, at well, doing? Let me, let, me, let me put it in perspective. Um, uh, I was very, you know, I think it was a thing that stemmed from the 70s, the whole punk ethic of do it yourself. But culturally, it meant much more. I saw the much bigger picture. Um, Maybe I was just an angry young young black man wondering why our music, our scene, and our culture isn't run by us. We've got no involvement. We're not acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And I really made that a mission in 1978, 79 to set about changing that. Because the catalyst was on my 21st birthday, um, I go to the, the Lacey Lady in Ilford with four or five of my black mates, 
um, and we get knocked back at the door. And I, I understand, you know, because even um, even now, I wouldn't let a gang of blokes come in, irrespective of colour. Hmm. But, you know, you could have... That ruined my 21st birthday that night. But wow. for me, it was like revelation time. And hmm. it was like, this is the last time something like this is going to happen to me. From here on in, I get involved in the sound or I build my own. I play my own music in my own venue. Nobody tells me I can't come in. Nobody dictates to me what music I play or what I listen to. Mm -hmm. And fr from that moment on, and then when I realized watching all the white mafia DJs basically sew up the scene, mm -hmm. um, not condemning them for that, it's because we as black people weren't smart enough to organize ourselves. Mm. And the only way for us to move forward was to organize ourselves. And when I did like a roll call, I went, well, these guys call Funkadelic. They're, they're 15 miles away from us, the other side of London. Mm -hmm. why, haven't, why don't I know who this guy is? Why haven't I got his phone number? Why doesn't he know who I am? Mm. You know, Jazzy B, Paul Anderson, they're playing in North London. Why haven't I got Paul's phone number? Why aren't we talking to each other? You know, Cleveland Anderson in, in the West. We didn't know each other. I was staggered. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'd made it my business driving around London for a couple of weeks, finding, going to their dances, getting everyone's number, and organizing like a, a black collective at my house, at my mum's house, with a view to starting our own radio station, Mm -hmm. playing our music, uh, interpreting our black sound culture. Um, and that meeting um, came to, um, Chris came, to the, was at that meeting, Paul Anderson, Cleveland Anderson, Bobby and Steve from Zoo, Derek Boland, mm -hmm. um, Tosca Jackson, um, George, the jazz DJ from... LWR. We didn't know each other. Oh, hold on. These are some of the most iconic, iconic yeah. DJs of the yeah. time for yeah. black music. Yeah. Well, th they weren't. We were all fledgling. We were all new. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find our way. Mm -hmm. They may be household names now, but in 1985, let me tell you, they weren't. Mm -hmm. The okay. only people who knew who they were, were were their mates around the way who were lifting their boxes on the front. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knew who they were. And that's one of the first things that I grounded them all. Don't think you're big zoopers. You're only big in your own dinner time. <laughs> big is when, big when you go to Birmingham and they know you. And big is when you go to Plymouth and they know you. And they're, and they're buying your tickets and they're coming to your dances. Anybody can sort of dance in Peckham or Lewisham or Hackney mm -hmm. with fly posters done with photocopies. <laughs> but how do you attract your, your, your brother or your sister who's living you know, slide. at the end of the central line from you. Mm -hmm. And they can't come to your dance because they don't know who you are. So, you know, we had to address all of these things. And when we did, then there was the assembling of a, of a, of, of a movement. Mm -hmm. And that's what really motivated me to get that organized. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the time, there was a few fledgling, emerging black-run um, pirate stations that was emerging. One or two of them did approach me to offer the last, I didn't want to join a black radio station. Just like I didn't want to join a white radio station. I want to join a radio station. Okay. I'm not okay. interested in it being black or it being white, you know, and I was very careful not to get pulled into that kind of conflict, which is why in the early days I wouldn't give um, interviews to black magazines because had they been on the case in the beginning, keeping an eye on what I was doing, Jazzy B, a few of us were doing it. We didn't know each other, but we were doing similar things at similar times, creating things. You know, their head was in the sand. They had no idea. Do you know who gave me my first interview? Who actively yes, yes. sought me out to give me an interview was the enemy, the bastion of white rock. That's mm -hmm. huge. So where, at what point, in your journey, what, what was you as a DJ when you got this call? Um, 
doing loads of things on the at a street level, you know, um, at a street sound system level that all that 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 Funkadelic was doing, was Rap, Rap Attack was, was doing, you know, but they, they were all just kicking off doors in, in old houses, you know, fulfilling a community need, but it was never getting any bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And it was only supported by a localized pirate radio network. Mm -hmm. We had no written media. No magazine was writing about Rap Attack kicking off a door or Funkadelic causing, you know, a roadblock. You know, that's where that term came from. That was hijacked and became into sort of popular vernacular. You know, the term hijack, really, the, the term roadblock, that they made a record and it was all roadblock and suddenly it became like popular vernacular. That comes from Funkadelic doing a party in, uh, what's the, in that place in Southeast London, some Camberwell Grove. Yes, Camberwell wow. Grove, yes. Yeah. Grove, yes. You know, fantastic Norman, place. Do you know the history of, you look up the history of Camber, Camberwell Grove, huge history there. Mm -hmm. They go there, black working class kids, do a party with the squatters in those big houses, in one of the big houses there, which was full of all young actors, young creatives, and they're playing black music to a mixture of those people. So when all the ragamuffin posses pull up in the road with their BMWs and 1600Es, they block the road. It's only a narrow road. Yeah. That's where the term roadblock comes from. Norman. Because they man them roadblock the road. <laughs> what other black... You no, know, you said mention NME gave you the call. What other black magazines were there around at that time? Well, the, the, there was um, not magazines. There was um, I, I can't remember what's uh, the the black newspaper. Really didn't get on board with what you know people like me were doing. Did for you two feel? Years. Did you feel? And I felt, I felt aggrieved at that, thinking why aren't? And then when they did get on board, they tried to to paint it as a you know as an anti-white pro-black thing. And I went, so, so was yeah. that? Would, would that have been the Echoes, Blues and Soul? No, not even then. Um, before, there was before that. Yeah, before that. Yeah. Okay. Well, all, all of those, and even then those magazines didn't really get on, um, popular magazines didn't get on to what we were doing. You know, every year, you know, I'm doing Carnival playing in front of 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, the Carnival was never really acknowledged. All the sound systems, all the DJs, all the people that performed there, never really acknowledged. Uh, we were invisible, but I thought that was great because then it, it allowed us to to grow, to evolve, to nurture. You know, without Carnival, there'd have been no such thing as jungle. There'd have been no such thing as drum and bass. Mm -hmm. No grime, no UK hip hop. Carnival gave the, the first platform to those young emerging creative kids from the inner cities. You know, they, they weren't getting those breaks at Soul Weekenders. <laughs> <laughs> and we had Matthew Phillip actually on um, a few weeks ago on Set the Trend and he kind of like expressed a similar thing and Carnival. I mean, what was it like sitting, playing uh, to just a few people and then uh, the transition from going from playing to just a few people to now, as my picture in the background shows, thousands yeah, of people on that red bus. You know, it took 20 years to get to that position. Mm -hmm. You know, in 1981, when we first went there, um, playing on Cambridge Gardens, it was a proper war zone. Um, again, I described that, you know, in, in my book, it was a baptism of fire. But I was young, naive, fearless, and so committed and believing in, in what I was doing. You know, Carnival was 95%, 99% um, reggae, soca, calypso. And the only nod to soul was Nina Simone, my baby just cares. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking, well, if I'm going to come there, I'm not going to come there to do exactly what everybody else is doing. The, Mastermind Roadshow was there. Herb, Herbie was was there, um, and I went out of curiosity, and because I knew them not well, but I went there. But Herbie came from a he was a studio 
engineer. Yeah. But his thing was about setting up sound. For me, the music they played was crap. But, <laughs> but at least there was somebody there trying to do it in, in Carnival. Yeah. There was another, another sound there called 6x6. Six six. They played half a dozen soul tunes, and then the default was back to the, the, the reggae and the soca. And I thought when I come there, I came with quite a purist attitude. So when I came there, when I play, there'll be no reggae played by me. You know, I'm coming there to add another dimension. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, so when I came there in 1980, you know, I was playing Thinking of You, Sister Sledge. Um, all the tunes that two or three years later went on to be big with the black sound systems. <laughs> but I know, and, and really will be able to back that up, you know. When I was playing that those records, nobody else was. <laughs> I mean, Rudy, I mean, question for Rudy. Um, what's your first-hand early carnival experience with uh, Norman J? Um, we used to get a fight. Mm. We used to get a fight, being the only, the only pure soul sound in carnival, mm. you know. Um, we used to get groups of boys who... Take off that. Yeah. Why right? Why right? Why right? Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But as Norman said, it's perseverance. Yeah, you know, we were a we were drawing. It wasn't just it wasn't just a white. We, there were there were black people who wanted to come and hear alternative music. There were yeah. black people who were into their soul who were into their house. They wanted to hear yeah. that as well. You know, it, it was the first sort of um, multicultural corner, as it were. Yeah, you know, we broke the rules. We, 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 we've, we've had. I remember one year mm. after Carnival, I, I think it was one actually, it was one of the best carnivals ever. It rained the whole day. Carnival 86, yeah, yeah it rained the whole day, the whole day. <laughs> and I think we, we, we managed somehow throughout the course of the day to set up a little bit of a towel pulling, but speakers were sodden, you know, wires and. You know, it, it was just mad. And I remember after we loaded the van, the infamous Hutchie's GT van. You know, <laughs> when you saw that van, everybody knew that GT was coming because it was all marked out with GT. <laughs> and I remember it was me and Joe. And we was on our... Norman, by this time, Norman and then everybody else had left and it was just me and Joe. And we got in the van and we was right, ready to go. And we got about half a mile down the road and the rear tyres went... <laughs> but you think you've got this you've got this box van three and a half ton box van loaded <laughs> with a sound system the pouring rain at about <laughs> nine o'clock on a bank holiday monday and there's no aa and obviously the roads are blocked off so nothing can come and recover you i remember me and joe had to get out we had to get the jack for the van and use a screwdriver <laughs> to lay on the ground and to turn this jack up to get the wheel. Mm. I think we arrived back at mum's, must have been about half 11, 12 o'clock that night, Norman. Yeah, yeah. I remember Norman's mum opened in the door and said, Rudy! <laughs> <laughs> that was an experience. But you know what, kind of all over the years, it's, you know, as you see, as you see it's grown from strength to strength. The crowd, it, it, it's... The atmosphere it's like a family mm -hmm. you and, know. And, and, and what are some of your carnival good times anthems are they, they are they slightly different from norman's what's no, yours there's, yeah there's there's many you there's know. loads there's, well, there's loads, loads. I mean, we, we there's, broke literally we broke so many uh, loads, records. loads. Um, yeah, well, let's, uh, one two let's give some titles give, let's let's make our audience know well i, I gave you a few don't well, as, I, I would say, I would say not, only, yeah, I would say not only, you know, not only in Carnival, you know, mm. just in general, good times, um, barely, as as was mentioned, barely breaking even. Yeah, no That's one much. Um, oh, Buttercup, Renee and Angela, and I remember I always used to say to Norman, you know, you're responsible for these tunes, but Norman, he would never take it. He would never take it, but he's the man, he's responsible. Universal yeah, Robot Band, barely breaking right. even. I probably play that six, seven times a week. Let me tell you a fact which isn't widely known. Um, 
before I had real aspirations to become a, a, a DJ in the early 80s, um, I made it a mission of mine to help up and coming black DJs with certain records. This is what fueled the whole rare groove thing even further. Because at that time, probably Derek Boland was probably my best mate, 82, 83. Um, we became really close um, friends because I'm hearing through the grapevine, being a West London guy, that there's a young kid who's doing big, big things in the heart of East London. And I thought, I need to go and investigate. I need to go and check this out. And I was trying to persuade my brother to go there with me. He wouldn't, wouldn't go. Then after a few weeks, I persuaded um, Joe to come with me. So we went from Acton to Cannon Town. And then when I saw the venue, I thought, fuck, like, this is an old... East End gangsters place, you know. I knew that <laughs> it was. It, it thought, literally was. It was. Thought, it's called the Bridge House. Yeah, it's not down now. There's a fly over there, but I'm thinking, you know, a lot of from the craze onwards, you know, serious gangsters in this place. How did these black guys get in there and run this thing? But what it was was um, DJ Froggy. God bless him. Mm. Um, Froggy was the closest to our culture that understood our culture because Froggy's following a lot of them East London black boys liked mm -hmm. him because he had twin decks. It's a sound system set up and he, and he was a, he built the super mat amp. You know, no one had ever seen technology like that. He was a sound engineer, built this console, unbelievable. And then for his warm up was this young black guy from South Woodford called Derek, mm -hmm. called Derek Boland. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing through the, the, the black, grapevine this kid is ramming this place on a sunday night you know and he plays with funkadelic occasionally he plays with mad hatters occasionally and i thought i need to go and check this out so i get over there with joe we go in i'm at the back because those days i never used to go where the djs played i used to stay miles away from it just checking the crowd crowd vibe it was packed you know, and he's playing music in there and everyone's liquid, this guy, and he'd rewind it, but he was mixing and scratching. And then he plays um, a Burgess tune. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, he plays Barely Breaking Even. And that's the first time I'd ever heard it out played by somebody else. Wow. And I thought, this kid is good. So at the end, mm -hmm. when everyone had gone, I walked up to him and I went, the Burgess sounded fantastic. And he went, Burgess, how do you know about Burgess? Da, 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 da. And that's and that's Leroy Burgess you're talking yeah, about. Leroy, yeah. he went, how do you know about? I said, listen, I've got everything he's ever done. He said, no, <laughs> no, I got to come up. I said, next week I'll come up, I'll bring you another tune. And and he was asking me about certain tunes. This is how I knew that he knew. He was asking me certain titles. I went, yeah, I got that. Yeah, I know that. So the next week I brought him up a twelve with another Burgess tune. He played it, the crowd went fuck, unbelievable. Broke the house down. Mm -hmm. And then Paul Anderson, Norman, I need da 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 da. <laughs> Alistair from Love Attack, I need da 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 da. And I thought that this was a way to, to supply and elevate all this young generation of black DJs on an equal footing with their white. But was you doing it like was you doing it like like everybody was doing back in the day, buying it for for fifty p and selling it for five? No, I was, buying, I was buying those records new. No, this is before all of that. Okay, this is how, this is taste. So it, wasn't, it wasn't a hustle. You was actually serving the DJs with the proper music. No, when I was going to America, I bought the record. That's how I knew them. I bought them all new as they were coming out. Then when I get to America, I find the same records again. You know, for a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. And just buy the lot and bring them back because that time in 1981 i was unemployed i had no job yeah. so i said, stand outside bluebird records stand outside a few records all the black djs that came there listen do you need a copy of this do you need a copy of that mm -hmm. you know and then when and it was it was politics for me it's a political thing mm -hmm. because you know, i'm walking around and i'm i'm turning on the radio i'm hearing you know big white chops claiming that they were playing this from you <laughs> and i'm going you never <laughs> I know you didn't. So, so what I did was on a couple of tunes, I put my initials on them and sold the records through a middleman, through somebody else, till DJ Big Name gets it. Okay. He then claims he had it from you. Then when I go and have a look, 
Yeah. It's got your initials on it. <laughs> and then you see how you see this is how this is working, and you see how they maintain control and keep us at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But the rare growth thing for me was absolutely brilliant because they were never going to get some of those records, A, because they didn't know them, and our DJs could put them to much better use mm -hmm. to, to, you know, to enhance their careers and all that. So for me, it was always a, a big, wider political, cultural thing for me. Right. Maybe because I was a little bit older and understood how it all, all worked you know all this doesn't mean anything now right. because you know, the generations have now come on but yeah. in those days it was so important it was the only way we were going to move forward yeah you know i can yeah. remember um and think rudy was there at the, the, this thing because I, I wasn't really a dj i was just a record collector and party person who yeah. helped his brother in the sound you know i didn't join great tribulation until 1979 by then the sound was already four or five years old but I didn't want to play on something that was called Great Tribulation. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, you know, I'm playing good times records. Yeah. You know, so like for, a little, for a little while, we kept it as just GT. When I used it, it was called GT. Mm -hmm. When Joe used it, it referred back to its original name. When I go to New York, the biggest tune out there is Chic, Good Times. It was like a light bulb moment. Mm -hmm. When I got back, this Can is what I call me? myself. I've already got GT on my boxes. So now when anyone asks me what GT stands for, it sounds for good times. How important was it for you, though, Norman, to be able to have a sound system to play soul music on? Because back in the day, not many sound systems yeah. were played. So, not, not many soul DJs had a yeah. sound system back, back in the day. I know. It was hugely important. The masters, of the, masters of the sub bass. Yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, I was quick to understand, to, to merge the cultures and, uh, and understood. The sonics of certain soul records would sound brilliant on a reggae sound system. I always knew that, you know, um, you know, whereas a lot of the dubs and some of the records out of Jamaica were not pressed that brilliantly, or they weren't mastered that, you know, these are promos from, from CBS, you know, these are promos from the, the biggest labels in America who press things properly. So mm. when you put them on a sound system, you'll never hear anything like it. Different level of sonics. Different level of sonics. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and on the little Citronic deck. <laughs> <laughs> I want to touch on a few things before we be, before we call it a day here. But I want to touch on your 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 dress sense, your trademark, your hat. You, you know the club that 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 you wear. Why did you feel to go down that lane of 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 um you, d -d dressing? It's just individual. You know, I didn't want to swim in the mainstream of everybody else. Um, you know, you what top is that own. one there? What top is that one there you got on there? Um, I, I don't know. It's um, a Gabichi. It's a Gabichi. That's a Gabichi. Oh, oh yeah, Ray's got his Gabichi on. He just wanted to show off his Gabichi. <laughs> 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 you know, I like a lot of vintage clothes. I've been buying vintage clothes mm -hmm. since the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Um, and don't really see myself as a style icon, but I just don't want to look. You know, the, the way the world is geared now, you know, it's one homogenized look, everything. It doesn't favor individuality. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter if you fail, just be be your own thing, be true to yourself. And that's always been been, been, been my thing. You know, anybody could do what everybody else is doing. But what's your favorite? But you must have a favorite brand of clothing or a favorite or no, a favorite I don't, I don't, no, I've never been a brand. Or, 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 no? No, not a brand follower. You know, I like style, not fashion. Mm. Right? Mm. There are people who follow fashions. Fashions come and go. Fashions mm. are disposable. Mm -hmm. Style mm. lives forever. That's not my quote. That's a famous quote from Coco Chanel. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Indeed, Norman, and I appreciate that. I'm glad you said that because uh, I, I sometimes get um, pulled up about my uh, fashion sense, but, you know, let, I do let, what I do. Let, let, let them pull you up. <laughs> about that because ultimately what you should do is tell them you know they wish they were you you're glad they're not them hey Norman don't you. give him lyrics don't give him any lyrics <laughs> <laughs> and Norman, Norman how does it feel to be called up by um, Denzel Washington um, I know Rod Stewart's in your black book um, these are some of 
you know, some iconic, iconic people for us. I mean, how does it feel when they call you and then they say, Norman, can you play a set of my party for me? Well, it, it's never, it's not a direct one-on-one -on -one contact. It, it comes through, you know, as one of the first black teachers to have management. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you, you have um, intermediaries mm -hmm. just as, as, as they do. You know, I know a few famous people, but I can't call them up and go, yeah, it, it doesn't work like that. There are <laughs> channels that you have to go through. <laughs> you know, um, sometimes the channels are impossible, but sometimes they're good. But it's partly by um, word of mouth and recommendation and trust. Um, trust is the biggest thing because, you know, um, I never kissed and I never told. You mm -hmm. know, I come to those parties or those events, I do my job and I see nothing, hear nothing, say nothing. And in this day of social media, it's all too easy to go and tweet about what you've seen and Instagram. Mm. I don't do any of that. Um, what do you think about that, though? I mean, you, 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 you exploded without that. I mean, God knows, yeah. God knows how big you may have been um, if, if you had embraced that and that was around at the time. But what do you think about social media now? Well, the, so the, the social media is a thing, you know, it's my own opinion, because I have these discussions with my sons and my nephews, you know, uh, Social media is like a, a lighter. It burns brightly, then it's over. Mm. There ain't no longevity in that because there's no mystery about you. Everybody's seen a million of your photos. Everybody thinks they know you. Everybody mm. thinks they, you know, clickbait. Um, there must, you must retain, you know, for me, because I'm, I'm a very private person, so there must mm. be some area of mystery. You don't have a right to have access to me, which is why I don't allow filming at my home. You know, I don't do too many of the things. If I have to go, I'll go out. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want, cool, look at my house, look at my car, look at my, you know, you don't need to know that. You know, because if I saw you on the street face to face and I ask you those questions, you tell me where to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's no, mm -hmm. no, no difference, you know, yeah, with, yeah. With the social media. No, you, you're not a friend of mine. I'm my not a friend in my phone book. I can call them. I can speak to them. I'm not. You know, I'm not interested in your house. I'm not interested yeah. in your cars. Yeah. But I am interested in your bicycles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. I believe. Funny, funny how many now. bicycle? How many chopper bicycles do you have? Do you possess? I'm scaling down the collection. I own about between twenty and thirty, I guess. And, um, and was that, what has been the what's what was the fascination? How did you get into choppers? It's like all things, you know, like like you. When I was a kid, you aspired to own those certain things. You know, the, the chopper mm. was the Xbox of my generation. It was the, the unobtainable. They cost when they were new in 1969 35 quid. Big my money. dad, yeah. my dad with five kids was earning 28 pounds a week. That wow. tells you unobtainable you know it's not happening and i liked them because i never never had one when i was a kid and then as i grew up i, I was in a found myself in a position that i could have as many as i want um, did you did you never have a bike or you never had no, a chopper? I, I always had bikes you know i yeah, still Tom, got my i still on, got a version of my bike from my my very first bike oh you're lucky mine got yeah. stolen yeah, mine got stolen. I stole bikes too. <laughs> it wasn't squeaky clean then. Well, we all did that. But then you realise, you know, that, that that's a that's a route to nowhere. To go, yeah. But um, you know, I own the bikes because I, I I love them. I restore them. It's it's my therapy. It's the same thing, you know. I've, you know, before social media, which is a great thing, people never knew that. You know, I have a collection of classic mini cars. I've owned classic minis. Since the seventies, yeah, you know, I've driven loads of cars, but you know, I own about five or six classic vintage minis worth a fortune. Wow. But right. they, they, well, when I bought them and worked on them 20, 30, 40 years ago, you know, uh, you know, I was one of those kids that took care of stuff. Yeah, and I never lent them out. You know, so. You know what? I was going to ask you, Mr. Norman J, um, about the minis, actually, and uh, how much you would sell one. But, um, since, since you said a couple of thousand, I think that's above my pay grade. So uh, you said you're downsizing on the choppers. Uh, yeah, how much yeah. would one of those cost me then? Well, there's loads of different ones. Um, 
and and I have to say that part of the um, the, the the rekindling of the interest in them was was down to me because in the I got my first one in 1988. Um, saw it in a junk shop. So I remember them for when I was a kid. Uh, that's the Mark III. Um, they're not worth <laughs> money now, but they will be. You know, okay. Was, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, but, the, but the Mark I's, when they, they first came out, they were ungainly, they were dangerous. But the one that everybody remembers are the Mark II that were made a bit safer. All the kids, yeah. if you're a 70s kid, you, you, you remember them. Um, but and the other one's a special edition, which is the Holy Grail. Man. One sold on eBay just just over a week ago for four thousand pounds. Oh wow! So, wow. so, so I, think I need to save up. I need to redo well, my contract. I don't, I don't know about saving up, Rich. I don't know about saving up. I think what we got to do I think is stop. even a crap one will set you back three four hundred quid. I, I think we got to stop looking for records and start looking for choppers. <laughs> choppers. <laughs> I think I think we need to increase my percentage on set the trend. That's what I think. <laughs> Norman, um, t- tell us um, because you are very radical in both thinking and in both how you apply it to your craft. How difficult or easy was it to accept um, an invitation to um, go go to the Queen's house and get given your MBE for your services? I had no problem with it at all. The greatest thing that ever happened um, for me. Um, and at the, at the time, I refused to get embroiled in the politics of accepting something. You know, let me get one thing straight. You know, I'm born here, right? I'm not a, a kid from the Caribbean or a kid from Africa. Who's, I'm born here. Before I was born here, England, Babylon had a queen. And if the monarch of the country chooses to recognize it. I'll tell you why I think, I'll explain to you why it was important. Because up until that time, um, most of the music media never really acknowledged what me and some of my contemporaries were doing. I'm talking about the, the black. Black DJs, Never yeah. really acknowledged. And I went, okay, you can keep your DJ top 100. You can keep the disc. None of them got recognized by the king or the queen of the country. That trumps everything. Right? <laughs> that's the, that, that thing. Nothing comes close. I was the first DJ and DJ of color to get um, an award you know, from the monarch. Usually it's for the charitable things that you, you, you did. And I've done a lot, but always on the down low, kept it quiet. Mm. But I've done loads of things for our people in our community, raised money, raised awareness at a time when it was unfashionable, when nobody was doing it. And let me tell you, I was, you yeah. know, um, ra- raising money to, you know, to to help, you know, starving Africans for, for school or water and, and and the war effort in Ethiopia and stuff like that in the eighties and, and, and the nineties. Um, but, you know, I was, I was doing all of that stuff and I thought it was for that, but actually it was for my my citation read for like, services to DJing and black music, which is a first, absolute wow. first. Amazing. Um, um, and then to, 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 to move that on, it kind of, in a way, opened the door for my other peers in music, in film, in the creative arts to get recognized. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, and I, I've often said, you know, I don't, but they could have given me a chocolate Easter egg. It, it wasn't about getting an MBE. You know, I can't change what happened four years, 400 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, but I can tell me it, it, it's wrong to have. The only difference I can make, I can help change tomorrow. And loads of black people in my community, even when I used to go to around the schools and, and do after hours uh, music things for, for, for disadvantaged black kids. In, in, in schools, you know, that gave me the greatest reward. You know, some of them youths, well, were, I remember once having to go to, I think it was somewhere near Pentonville Prison, having to give an awards, um, give out awards for, for mostly black um, uh, teenage kids who'd been in trouble with the law, who'd sat courses. And I remember going in this room, there was about a dozen of them there. Not one of them could look me in the eye. Mm. You know, and I went, listen, that's got, a, you're not showing me 
you guys ain't shown me anything. What you lot are just learning, I've long since forgotten. And it lightened the mood up. Hmm. I said, you know, you, you, you think you, you, things are bad for you. Do you know where I come from? Don't give me that hard luck story because I come from the same ghetto as you. You yeah. make a born choice. You work to get out of it or you succumb to it. Yeah. It, it's a choice that you make. Now, no one makes, you're not born a criminal. If you want to do that, that's up to you. I've got two grown-up sons now in their, in their 30s and 40s who, who I used to say the same thing, you know, be responsible for yourself. But anyway, you know, I'm digressing a bit. I did this thing. It, it was amazing. It gave me a real insight into to meeting some of these kids who'd never been acknowledged for anything. All they did was do a simple course over three or four months, get really good marks, and and they were so lacking in social skills, interactive skills. They couldn't look at you, couldn't shake. And, and one of them came up to me and said, you're that DJ, in it? They don't know your name. They don't know anything. You met the queen, innit? That, that is brilliant. You know, that, that is leading by example without preaching. Mm -hmm. All I can do is do the right thing and hopefully the right people will see you're doing the right thing. Th that, that's what it means. The, the MBE is an enabler. That's what it means. It's a seal of approval to enable, not about, uh, please, please forget 400 years of slavery. Sorry we invaded your country and killed billions of your people. They do that anyway. <laughs> but you can't change history, but you can influence change tomorrow. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's what the MBE used positively means. Mm -hmm. I could pick up the phone and phone somebody, and they have to answer me. And I made a conscious choice to put MBE after my name in a public situation, whereas most people don't, then what's the point of them giving it to you? It's it, it's a badge to go, you will effing respect me. You will, you know, you will listen when I'm speaking to you. Mm -hmm. You will treat me as an equal. You know, I, I used to joke back when, in the early days when I first got it, the only people that had to bow were Arsenal fans. But you know, it, it, it's a person's choice because you know, uh, 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 another guy who I, I won't name, it was quite public about him refusing it. And I took a little bit of stick, but I didn't listen to those losers. I don't have to justify to you about a decision that's personal to me. You know, it's how you use something that's given to you or awarded to you. You know, I felt Im immense pride. My, my parents were proud. My children were proud. My friends were proud. Old people in the community were, were proud. Would they be the same proud if, the, if a judge was sent in to me, you know, for 10 years for rape or burglary? No. Nah, they put not. on the news every day? Right, it's, yeah. Norman, it's been a, it's, it's an amazing conversation and... Uh, it would be great. It would be lovely if this could last forever. I know we're running out of time. I just want to touch now you on... You guys have to keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I, I just want to touch on your love, Philadelphia, celebrating their birthday. 50 years? Yeah, 50 years. Yeah, 50 years this year of Gamble and Huff. Total. Time, Philly International. Mm. I, I heard part one of your radio show the other day. Yeah. Superb. Yeah. Couldn't, I mean, fit it all, couldn't fit it all in. Oh no, no, it, it's that that would take about five or six shows. But it's and, not just the label; it, it's it's the the music that I was. I, I'm into this stuff from the '60s to the present day. Um, do you know it, what I wanted to know? Because um, Simon Dunmore, I think it is, um, yeah. or Dimitri from Paris, did yeah. a kind of like Philadelphia Records remix yeah. type package. Yeah. I'd love to know what your why you didn't go into doing remixes in that way as a DJ. Well, just because you're a duck doesn't mean you like water. Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, even Femi. You know Femi and his album. You know who his A and R man was? Charles Peterson. Who's the executive producer of that album? No, Norman J. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Let me show you something. I don't know if you can. Where is he? Good. I oh, oh, my days. Days. He's, gone into, he's gone into the archives. Rudy. Rudy. 
He wow. was going to show you something. <laughs> Rudy. Um, hopefully he'll come back on. Um, I mean, he has got to come back on because we want to say bye to him properly. Um, Rudy, he's an exceptional um, gentleman. Um, inspirational. Um, radical. Um, very humble, though. He, very very humble. humble, but he's humble. also someone who is really... Um, someone who's really fighting for black empowerment, you know what I mean? You, you know, um, and that is very rare in his own way. Um, he's yeah. not doing it, you know, he's not following the script of anybody else. He's doing it in his own way. Um, how does it feel to be around someone like him on a, I don't know, um, uh, on a weekly or a monthly basis or however long that you do? We, do we, we, we speak, I mean, we speak just... Just like how I would touch base with any of you guys, that's how me and Norma are, mm -hmm. you know. And it's nothing's changed from back then in the nineteen eighties till now, you know. We're brothers. His mum always says, "I'm part. I'm. I'm. I'm her son." She. She's always called me her son. Do you know what I mean? So I'm part of the family. So, it, but as an individual, you know, like I said over the years, watching him and just seeing how everything is and how he operates, how he deals with the crowds and... I'm back. He, <laughs> he back. is. He I don't is. know what happened to you there. I, I don't know what happened to you there, Norman. I, I, I pressed the button, but I just wanted to... Um, <laughs> just bear with it. me. I, I'm so unaccustomed to this <laughs> this stuff. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Hey. Yes, ah, the can. black. Mm. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's me told, hundred yeah. percent. Mm -hmm. We see it. We I know you it. worked at. Um, obviously, you did the A and R in at um, uh, Talking Loud Records, but yeah, well, I was a senior A and R man there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Wowza! Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that. I'll be honest with you, Dorman. I didn't know. I thought it was a Giles Peterson signing. Yeah. See. Yeah. Norman. 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 <laughs> that's that's why we call it set the trend, you know. Yeah, <laughs> set the trend back. big time. I'm I'm um, inspired to keep on my journey of being quirky and yeah. also um being just different. It's not being different. They're different. You're normal. That's yeah. your normal. You know, I learned that from my punk friends in the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, you have pins through their noses. I learned that from my skinhead friends that people used to think they were NF. Mm. But yeah, actually they weren't and they're not they're the ones who have still got their trojan tattoos 40 50 years later just Wicked. got hijacked yeah just the culture just got hijacked mm -hmm. um before we let before we let you go we got to let rudy go first um okay. rudy R rudy ranks um thank you for um coming on set the trend thank you for letting me into your black book um <laughs> i tell you what it, it's this is the so... best dj right here sir let me tell you something about your DJ. If, if, if I he wasn't met... the DJ, I'd have sacked him off years ago. <laughs> Wicked. I can see, I, I, can, met... I can tell why he is the DJ he is. I have to yeah, say. I first yeah. met Rudy about 29, 20, uh, 2009, and I met him in St. Lucia. He was playing for another friend of yours, Rick Clark. Um, for the jazz sugar and spice, okay. I was I was sugar. telling Raymond about the all day that we done with Steve Walsh and Rap Attack and yeah, yeah, yeah. sugar and sp Rick Clark. <laughs> and um, Rudy, um, something happened to me on on the trip that I got schooled in at the time, and Rudy took me to the side, and it's the first time also I I heard him play. Um, two things, he gave me some knowledge that day that I've carried forward and I've used to better myself as a as a selector as, as a as a as a person that plays music mm. and also i looked at the way that rudy could change between genres of music and his wide knowledge of music and i took that from him those are, are two of the things that i that i incorporated into how i play music nowadays mm. your mm. selector rudy ranks mm. but part of but part of that is yeah, part of that is down to norman mm -hmm. I can see. I can. I can. I can feel that. I can yeah, you can see the influence. No, we took, you know, we took, you know, you know yeah, I mean. it's about never having a fear of failure. Mm. I just give you a quick anecdote. One year at Carnival, probably that the year that you got that picture behind you. Um, uh, you might have been there, Rudy. I went to play a Clash record, and and instead of playing the Clash tune I really wanted to play, 
Because no black sound system ever played The Clash. No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> uh, well, I play Police and Thieves on my, um, uh, now and again. In, in yeah, my, but I'm course. saying in those days, you with black DJs and black sound, that, that was a no-no. And I ended up playing White Riot. Oh, I wow. White Riot. There's all of that crowd standing there, and they went deathly quiet. <laughs> and it's that moment, do you take it off? And really looked at me, and I went, no, leave it on. Let the thing play. It's only three minutes long. And after about <laughs> five seconds in the, in the song, some of the white people got it and went, wicked. They started jumping up down, pogo in. All the black kids stood to one side. And my actions, you'll get your music in a minute. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, this is what's playing us. Only three minutes long. If you don't like it, go and get a drink. Mm -hmm. this, this is staying on. And I was, and I, Styled it out and wouldn't, didn't explain it, didn't apologize for it. I think mean, that was live on um, Radio London. Wow. We were doing a live broadcast at Radio London at that time. Wow. And I'm not kidding. The, the feedback from that one track that I played by mistake, you know, because <laughs> I've always played The Clash, really tell you, because I, you know, I, I got to know Mick's drummer really well um, before he died. You know, um, a personal mate of mine who I speak to all the time is Paul Weller, one of my good mates. Wow. Oh, well, yeah. 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 Um, and I just let it play. And I know for a fact that we played, and I say we, me and Rudy and my brother, we played certain quite a lot of white tracks later on mm -hmm. that black kids go, wow, but it worked. You know, we, yeah. we I used to play Talking Heads long before the hip hop people took Wicked. it and, and sampled it. Isn't that right, Rudy? Yeah. Once yeah. in a lifetime. Yeah, mm -hmm. like yeah, all of those kind of left field sort of punky. I love those records. Yeah, and on my sound system, no one's going to tell me you can't play them. Yeah. There's no <laughs> such thing as can't yeah. play. It's I remember Blur. playing um, Blur Two in Earl's Wine Bar once, mm. and the first like similar to you, the first couple of seconds, people were like what the, f and then uh, you know they got into it and started yeah. dancing to it. And yeah. I, I think I played the Rembrandts. You know, the Friends tune. I'll be yeah, there. Yeah. If we'll, but it's what, over the place. Yeah. Again, it's programming. It's timing. Yeah. You know, as mm. sometimes I get it really right, and other times I've got it badly wrong. Oh. But, you know, who cares at the end of the day? You know, no one's died. It's only a record. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. Just to say, Norman, before we go, we have the artist Sinclair in the mm. building, and he's saying... Um, you, um, you was you signed him. You and Giles signed him for his very first single. Is that oh, correct? Right. Yeah, yeah. track for him. Yeah, that's that's right. Legend, yeah. legend, wow. legend. One, one, he's one wow. of our legends. Yeah. Norman, we've got to go. Um, we we haven't even. I don't think we've got in, even in fifty percent into your archive, into your history. And we did really want to touch on. Um, this side first. His book is out. It's been out about a couple of years. Please go and get it. It's an it's a very interesting read well, as well. Can't read. It's on audio as well. It's great. It's on audio. <laughs> you did promise to come back, Norman, because this is the. I think this is the first. Uh, you know what? I've just so much enjoyed the history and the teachings that you've given. You know, what I mean, it's kind of. This time for part two, you need to make it more structured. We um, will do. Your 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 research needs to be a bit more thorough, so then we can go into. Se separate topics oh, that relate to and add up to what you're doing now. Otherwise, it's just a little bit disparate. And if your listeners don't know or don't understand, it's it's difficult to pick up mm -hmm. to make the connection. So Thank you. Thank you. We will take that on board and we will make sure that we have it tip top in the right order for you, sir. Indeed. You, now you, you, had it, you had it going on brilliantly today. You know, it was a nice surprise to have Rudy on and I mean, it was a bigger surprise. It was a, it was an even better surprise for us because, as I said, um, I think the, I think the people that have seen what you've brought to the game, um, yeah. and and what you've still got and what your legacy is, and we haven't even, as I said, touched on so many different parts of yeah, what you know you've what brought to the music game per se. You know what my legacy is? It's you, you guys, guys like you. Yeah, that's well, the legacy. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, you know, my legacy stole me in the face. And I'm proud to even yeah. just say, 100%. look, Norman Jay's the legend. What you do with it is up to you. Indeed. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, well, we're trying to do the right things here. This is what part of Set the Trend is, and we're just trying to 
bring some of this teaching, some of these, you, you know, some of your 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 blessings that you have, some of your inspirations that you have to fit into the wider DJ fraternity. There's DJs that are younger than us, complain about some of the same things that you talk about that you went through 30 and 40 years about playing music, about not having the bravery to do that, about getting, you know, getting, getting, um, um, fighting against the odds. And I think what you said today would just resonate with so many yeah, DJs. Don't, don't give up. It's not the music that's bad. Just go and find another crowd. <laughs> true, true. Uh, so true. Words of yes, love words it. of wisdom. Love it. Norman love J. It. Salute. Five star general, yeah. MBE, in the building. Thank you very much for coming on Set the Trend, and we we'll hope to see you soon. The Don Dada, the legends. We go. Cheers, have Rudy. Guys, have you guys been jabbed yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. A lot, of, a lot of our people are believing conspiracy theories and not having it. I've had the jab. I've got the second one to come. Good man. Good man. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, you Norman. I want to see you all again when we do a roll call in September in the autumn. Brilliant. I don't want to hear that it's about someone's got sick, they can't make it. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Rudy, thank you. Thank you. Rudy, thanks a lot. Thank you. Good night. My J, good night. Gee wee. Wow. Did I get did I get taken to school today? Yes, I did, bro. Yes, I did. Do you know what? He's just given me some inspiration for the next 10 years at least. Same as me, likewise. You know what? I was doing, you know me, obviously, I do a lot of left field stuff and Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was getting despondent with it and I, I, I sat down funny enough about two weeks ago and said right I'm going to start a new type of thing that I'm going to be doing from a DJ perspective because mm -hmm. people kept saying well you've got to sell tickets for this gig you've got to sell tickets for this gig to get on a bill and I was I was getting despondent and, and honestly I was actually close to kind of like saying you know what I'm not even going to bother to even do DJing anymore from a club perspective. I was actually really? going to just do it online. And just hearing what um, Norman said today and hearing what he's, you know, the, the positive vibes and me believing again that I'm on the right track. I'm older, but I'm on the right track and I will just do it to enjoy for myself. So for me, <laughs> you put out what you're doing and if people want to come, they come. It's, it's not yeah, the record. Not it's not the record, it's the crowd. Find a new exactly. crowd. Find Go find another crowd. So but I won't also, be DJing at all white Coco. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> joking. But also, um, what I loved about Norman was his inspiration for for fighting for his own, fighting yeah. for his fighting for his community, and m making sure that you know he builds that next piece of the ladder, that next piece of the step for someone else to come up. That you listen. You know, for some of us, uh, we've been fighting for that for a long time, and just to hear someone do that, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, like, I just hope that you know the community gets 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 together, listens to some of that, and um, if it if, if it's not for us, then it's for the next generation who's coming. Hmm. Indeed, yeah. Amen to Norman, man. Amen. Absolutely intelligent guy, been, and you I, can tell it, it all that all needs to sink in for a minute. You know, there was a lot in it. He needs to just think it and then it's like, okay, wow. When you well, get taken to school like that, it's just, yeah. that's, that's the kind of teacher that I should have had. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, like, back in in my schools. yeah, you know what I mean? You just concentrate, you take in every word. And then you can also rewatch back this podcast because I know some of you are going to need to, to get the actual teachings that he was saying in. Some of you, it may have gone over your heads, but you can rewatch it back on Set the Trend podcast on YouTube and subscribe to the channel. Yeah. Indeed. More than just music, <laughs> the knowledge, the wisdom. Salute, Norman J. One week from the end of the series, lads. We've been here since early January. Uh, um, and because of COVID, we went online. They'd set the trend live. This is the second series. We're gonna. We have. We have signed up on a contract of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Budden style. Um, heads of terms. For, yeah, we've done heads of terms. For, for, we'll be back in September, I think, after next week. Next week is our last show, and mm -hmm. it's a season finale. I am going to, I am, listen, next week, Gary and Calvin 
to the main security um, um, gentleman that we use different businesses. Oh, there was one business at one time and they went on their separate ways, two separate businesses, but they've done so much for keeping our events safe over the last 30 to 40 years. No, 30 years? About 30 years. About 30 years. A long time. Long time. So long. 30 odd years. Um, and we're going to have them in the building next week, Saturday. And we'll be talking about the whole security um, framework business from start to finish. Promoter, security, promoter, customer, promoter, safeguarding, promoter, life on the right on the edge there. You know what I mean? Because they give it all. They do give it all. So we'll be talking about that next week, Saturday, for the finale, the final show. Raheem Devon. Ra you know what? We didn't Mr. even get Soul a chance. Man. Jesus, what a performance. Ooh. And we what didn't even get a chance to talk to him proper, did we? He just, did, you get, he, did you see the chat going crazy when he was performing? <laughs> Listen, we don't play about on this podcast, though. We don't play about on this podcast. I wonder if Pamela was throwing uh... <laughs> and, and Nickers, you can say that. It's past 12. You can say yeah, that, Yeah, Pamela man. Allen throwing a... Uh, um, well, you say it on a Sunday, 11 o'clock. <laughs> 10 o'clock, actually. 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was a, you know, a nice performance by Raheem. Um, Excellent. One of my favourite DJ. And as Reggie says, I can't wait to say that I... I'm the only sound <laughs> in the United Kingdom. I have the most Raheem Devon dub plates. Without apology. Yeah, I'll tell you what, <laughs> up around here. Everything's <laughs> smashing up around here. <laughs> you know what that was? Remember when Norman said, I don't care about if you only person play this record. That was God shining on you and saying, yes. I never said that I'm the only you. person to play them. I'm not <laughs> the only person to have them. I'm yeah. not the only person to have them. That's yeah. something separate, as Norman yeah, you, would say. You, I am you, the person you, that plays the most of them, though. You got, I love you got, the, you got to work your magic and try and get that new one, though, because that song's. Oh, I do, in it. Yeah, excellent. And that's out, in, and his album's out in early yeah. June, he said. Yeah, so make sure you go quiet. and support. Oh, I, wonder, I, I wonder if that's going to happen. Of course, it's going to happen. <laughs> shh. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> what are you up to this week, EastEnder? Uh, quiet one this week, just uh, in the office, trying to uh, get some stuff over the line. Tuesday night, Facebook Live, and a couple, yeah, and some few meetings, more meetings. <laughs> Reggie, why are you still laughing? Because of, um, <laughs> let me see what Pamela's put on there. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say something about I was going to say something about me having big boxer shorts as well to match. What is funny though it is a Ray favorite. It's got eight likes. <laughs> anyway, um, Eastender, what are you up to? I just said my. Are you to your, see, you just get me this big stuff, it, it, Reggie. What? Why? What are you up to this week? Okay, so I've put together this um, uh, new mixtape series. The first of it is Soul Funk and the Disco. So I've been busy doing that, doing video editing. So tomorrow on my radio show, I'm going to do the official launch. It's five mixes, which are going to be available to download. And then also after that, I've got a new R&B and a new uh, soul stuff coming out as well, in time for the summer for everybody. So, you know, because the... Um, Bars are now back open. I'm going to be out and about next week uh, at different spreading, various spreading places. Spreading your germs. Sorry? Spreading your germs about no, you. I'll still be sitting outside. I've got to big up um, John Pina, who I bumped into in the uh, Brixton. Excellent news reader. Excellent. Yeah, Former BBC. In, in Brixton. And so I, I, I did discuss with him about coming on Set the Trend, but he didn't seem to know what we were. But, you know, that's an <laughs> give, him, give him the link. Give him the link. If you said breaking news, he would have been on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that's, that's it, basically. Just looking forward to pushing that all week. And then uh, stuff with DCR and um, GMD, um, my African label, obviously, Sierra Connect, getting closer and closer to uh, getting some stuff out for autumn. So, uh, yeah, really, really, that's it, really. Just looking forward to getting out, man. Summer's coming, man. 
No Summer engine variant ain't going to stop me. Jab number two coming. Ladies, I got jabs, so I'm going to come for the rubs. <laughs> <laughs> Richie, Richie, um, there's a song. sorry, Ray, before, there's a song that I'm after. English girl named Fiona. Big batty girl named Abiola. Body shaped like Coca-Cola. Do you know that? Oh, yes. Number back one up, record. Up. To the Big owner. up Russ. Big up Tion Wayne. Number one drill record, number 14 on the global charts. What a phenomenal um, achievement. And uh, big up to Russ. And apparently, isn't he um, one of your family's um, uh, nephews, Mr. Uh, uh, I, I don't know about ne- yeah, but remember that we're all, that we're black. So nephews, we use that word loosely, but it, okay. it might be a close friend or cousin, cousin, cousin. Okay, you know what I mean? well, congrats but, to him. Yeah. Obviously, we know Russ, he did the... Um, Gun Lean and uh, the Keisha Becky yeah. and all that. He's, a, stuff he's one of Lucian's finest. He's a Lucian. Yeah. He's a he's a yeah. Lucian lad. So, so number one, I got to big up the guys. I be, I got to big him up. You know, he, 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 to get a number one drill record is just phenomenal. To get oh. a global, we're not talking about just the UK. We're talking about it was number one in Australia. It's number one in various parts, of, other parts of the world. But number 14 on the global Spotify charts. Do you know how hard that is to do and to achieve? So big up the team at Atlantic. And, uh, yeah, well done to um, Russ and um, Tion Wayne. Breaking the ground. You can find me tomorrow morning. I'll be on Breakfast Blues duty, 9 o'clock till midday. I'll also be raiding into Matt White and Catch a Groove on Twitch. So stay in tune for that. We're going to be it's raiding into it. Um, into Catch a Groove at 12 midday tomorrow on Twitch. So oh, for wow. all of those of you on Twitch. And I ain't doing nothing for the rest of the week. Just busy, busy, busy trying to get deals over the line. Got a couple of business meetings. <laughs> and we got we got about three of them. I think we've got a meeting on Monday as well now. That's been added Monday, to Monday, well, Monday schedule. So there's three meetings I've got this week to get things over the line. And hopefully we'll be able to mention a few things that we're what we'll be doing in the future. But... I am very enthused, very happy today. I don't know how we got that one over the line. Norman J, you know. Norman what a huge, yeah, huge rhymed. victory. Um, I, I, and Rhyme Devon over the line too, at saying that. Um, yeah, big show today, lads. Well done. <laughs> Thank you to our producers. Thank you to you guys in the chat room keeping us company, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube. Remember, the show will be on YouTube. You can go back and re-watch it at your leisure set the trend podcast please share and subscribe to the channel please um it is important it is us telling the history um of our culture um and leaving a legacy for people to um know the real story as you heard it today i don't think (laughs) in no uncertain terms did you hear it today he pulled no punches today norman j mbe I've got, I've, got, I've got nothing more to say than we're out of here and I'm going to go and watch the re-one again straight <laughs> up. See we you guys see later. Okay. Next week. Yeah. Bye-bye. See you later. Friend is out of here.